This happened to me a few years ago, down in the Ozarks. I'm Wes, got myself a small cabin out there near one of the lakes, perfect for fishing, bit remote for most folks. Suits me fine. Spent most of my adult life dealing with big city crowds, all the noise and chaos that comes with it. Figured a dose of backwoods tranquility might do me some good. Never could have guessed what I was trading it for. The day it started seemed like any other. Woke up at dawn, fixed myself some coffee, then headed out to my boat for some early morning fishing. Still some fog hanging over the lake that time of day, swirling around the pines on the shoreline, kind of a quiet beauty to it. I pushed off into the still water, trying not to make too much noise, hoping not to scare off my catch. About half an hour in, I noticed something, off. Seemed like the fog was getting thicker, and it wasn't rising, exactly, more like hanging lower, swirling in unnatural ways. And the silence, the usual early morning sounds of birds and such, just gone. It wasn't a natural hush, more like something was sucking all the life out of the air. It was the smell that made me really sit up and pay attention. This musky, rotten stink, like nothing I'd ever smelled before. It crawled up the back of my throat, sent a shiver down my spine. Something in my gut instinct told me to turn back, but stubbornness kicked in. Ain't never been scared off my lake before. I muttered to myself. I cast my line again. But something was wrong with the fish, too. Usually I get a few nibbles at least, enough to keep it interesting. This time, nothing. Lake seemed dead as stone, and that silence kept pressing in on me, squeezing out my breath. Decided maybe it was time to quit being an idiot, started pulling up the anchor. Then I heard it. A low, rumbling growl, coming from the direction of the shoreline. Didn't sound like any animal I recognized. Too deep, too guttural. Chalked it up to my nerves getting the better of me. Got the anchor up, started to turn the boat, and that's when I saw it. The creature stepped out of the fog, smooth as you please. Hulking, seven, eight feet tall at least, crouched over on its hind legs. Fur matted and dark, covering its body head to toe. And the head... Wolf-like in shape, but bigger, with a too long muzzle filled with rows of teeth. Eyes were like burning coals in the gloom, fixed on me with a chilling hunger. For a frozen second, either of us moved. Then it let out a roar that echoed across the lake, a raw sound that ripped through whatever calm I had left. The boat lurched violently as it leapt for the water. I fumbled for the outboard hand shaking as I yanked the cord, desperately praying the engine would turn over. I heard a splash behind me, a spray of icy water. Glanced back, just in time to see a massive, clawed paw slam down on the edge of the boat. Splinters flew, and the vessel rocked dangerously. The creature lunged again, and by the grace of God, the engine sputtered to life. The boat surged forward, narrowly missing those lethal claws. I barely took a breath as I wrenched the throttle as hard as it would go. The creature roared in rage, scrambling onto the shore. It chased alongside the boat for what felt like forever, inhumanly fast, its breath coming in ragged gasps. The smell of it, of rot and wildness, choked the air, thick enough to taste. I didn't dare look back again, just focused on driving like my life depended on it, because it did. Eventually, the lake curved, and the shoreline fell away slightly. The creature didn't follow me out across the open water. It stood at the tree lean, watching, those yellow eyes full of malevolent fury. Finally, with a last, frustrated snarl, it turned and disappeared back into the trees. I kept the boat going full throttle until I was a good mile out. Finally slumped against the steering wheel, 
heart pounding hard enough to break my ribs. Spent the next hour just drifting until the worst of the shakes stopped. Then I forced myself to head back, no choice but to retrieve my truck and trailer from the launch. Figured if the creature was still around, it'd wait for me to come to it. Made it back to shore without incident. Kept watch the whole time, but saw no sign of those yellow eyes. Loaded up the boat double quick, and got the hell out of there. Didn't tell a soul for months, didn't want folks thinking I'd lost it entirely. But after a while, it felt wrong to keep it to myself. Figured there might be others out there, folks who needed a warning. Started a blog, one of those ones where people report weird encounters they can't explain. Laid out exactly what I saw, where, down to the lake and launch site. The response, it was more than I bargained for. Turns out, those hills hold old secrets. Messages rolled in, stories stretching back generations. Some vague, half-remembered whispers about a walker in the woods. Others detailed, sickeningly similar to my encounter. Hunters stalked, hikers vanishing, half-eaten remains turning up, always with the telltale stink of something both dead and alive. It hit me, a cold fist in the gut. I wasn't just some crazy old fisherman with an overactive imagination. There was something out in those woods, something ancient and terrible and hungry. And most chillingly of all, the locals knew, had always known, and just let folks like me stumble into that darkness blind. It made me angry, a simmering kind of anger that burned hotter than fear. After that, I couldn't go back to my cabin, at least not alone. Sold it for cheap, lied to the buyers about some family emergency needing me back in the city. Instead, I rented a cramped motel room, close enough to the Ozarks that I could drive out in a few hours, but far enough from the trees to breathe easy at night. Spent my evenings scouring the internet for anything resembling what I'd seen, old native folklore, cryptozoology sites, even the dusty archives of backwoods newspapers looking for old disappearances. Turns out, the creature had a name, at least, sort of. Different tribes, different eras, but the story was the same. Shapeshifter, predator, walker between worlds. And every few decades, the stories got fresher, the descriptions too precise to ignore. Enough to make a pattern, a chilling realization that the creature surfaced regularly, like a cicada with a taste for human flesh. I also found people. Not many, but enough. A park ranger with a haunted look in her eyes who'd stumbled across something horrific on patrol. A bow hunter who swore, trembling, that he'd put three arrows into it with no effect. They all had the same look, a desperate kind of certainty that the rational world, the one you could trust, was thinner than they'd ever imagined. We started meeting up, coffee shops, anonymous online chats, wherever felt safest. Shared information, pieced together sightings, tried to track the creature's movements. It was a pitiful little resistance movement, fueled by half-crazed desperation and a sliver of foolish hope that maybe if we understood this thing, we could find a way to stop it before it killed again. Problem was, it wasn't some wild predator you could trap or outsmart. This thing was cunning, patient, with a territory that could span half the state. We needed a plan, one better than just reacting to scattered reports. Tom, the ex-ranger, he knew maps and terrain better than any of us. Started pinpointing old legends, the consistent sightings. Turned out they formed a rough circle, with a patch of national forest deep in the Ozark Heart dead center. Figured that was either its lair, or the center of its hunting ground. Stupid or not, it was better than sitting around waiting for the news to bring us another grisly body. A few weeks later, we geared up. Not fancy. Tom with his service rifle, Lena, 
the bow hunter, with her competition-grade compound bow, me with my old hunting shotgun loaded with the heaviest buckshot I could find. We drove in under the cover of darkness, heading for a remote trailhead on the edge of the circle. Figured best chance was to hole up, watch the area, maybe get lucky enough to cross its path. Set up camp in a hollow tucked between two ridges. Dense brush all around, giving us cover and good sight lines. The next few days were about waiting and watching. That forest, it felt different out there. Not a friendly silence, but an emptiness, like something had sucked all the natural life out of the place. Nights were the worst. There'd be rustling in the brush, the snap of a twig, and even knowing it was likely just deer, I'd sit bolt upright, drenched in cold sweat, convinced those glowing eyes were peering at us from the darkness. By the fourth morning, morale was not great. Started to feel like we were chasing ghosts, fueled by shared delusion. Then, just before noon, Lena hissed, Movement! We all crouched lower. She was right. Something big and dark, slinking through the trees about a hundred yards out. I couldn't make out details, not at that distance. Slowly, I eased my shotgun into position, heart thundering. It stepped into a break in the foliage, and the morning light hit it. Even with the distance, I knew. That massive, hunched form, the two long limbs, the glint of yellow eyes. It paused its head swiveling slightly, like it was sniffing the air. My finger tightened on the trigger. This was it, our chance, maybe the only one we'd get. Then, it happened so fast I almost missed it. Another shape burst from the undergrowth behind the creature. Smaller, leaner, but just as unmistakably inhuman. Leapt onto the first creature's back, teeth bared in a snarl. They became a whirlwind of claws, fur, and rage. We gaped in stunned amazement as they tore into each other, snarls and roars echoing through the trees. Then, as quickly as it started, it was over. The smaller beast ripped out the throat of the larger one in a shower of blood, then dropped lightly to the ground. The dying creature thrashed for a few moments, then went still. The victor stood over the body breathing raggedly. And despite its smaller size, there was a chilling power in its stance, an aura of a predator claiming its kill. It slowly turned its head towards our hiding spot. Three pairs of human eyes locked with a single pair of those burning yellow ones. In that moment, I understood. We weren't the hunters in this story. We were the prey, just a different species on the menu. It took a single step towards us, then froze, cocked its head slightly, as if listening to some distant call. Then, with a last, disdainful look in our direction, it turned and dragged the carcass of its kin deeper into the shadows. We didn't speak as we packed up our camp in frantic silence. Didn't talk all the way back to the cars, or for days after as we scattered back to our lives leaving the heart of that forest undisturbed. The aftermath is the part that eats at me. The others, I don't know what happened to them. Think I saw Lena in a grocery store a few months later, but her eyes were hollow, and she didn't recognize me. Tom might still be out there, a wild-eyed hermit haunting those remote trails. Maybe he's found what he was looking for, maybe not. I'm back in my city, trying to build some semblance of a normal life, but it feels like a bad imitation. Sometimes, late at night, I think I hear the rumble of a distant growl echoing in the air-conditioned quiet of my apartment. I tell myself it's just the traffic, but the old fear prickles at my neck. Because part of me, a small, stubborn part one can't fully extinguish, knows this story isn't over. Out there, in the wild places, those shadows still move, those eyes still gleam. And sooner or later, hunger will stir them again.
This happened to me a few years back when I was working as a park ranger. My name's Joel. I'd always loved the outdoors, so being a ranger was a dream come true. It wasn't all trail maintenance and picnics, though. Part of the job was investigating odd reports, and that's what led me into those woods. I was assigned to Silver Creek National Park, deep in the heart of Washington State. Dense evergreen forests, towering mountains, it was the kind of place that makes you feel small. We'd been getting strange calls from hikers. Reports of disappearances, weird noises at night, that sort of thing. Most of it was nonsense, folks getting spooked by shadows or wild animals. But then Michael went missing. He was an experienced hiker, not the type to get lost. Search parties combed the forest and found nothing. A few weeks later, I was on patrol near an old logging trail. The sun was dipping below the trees, casting long shadows. It was quiet, except for the wind rustling through the leaves. I turned a corner, and that's when I saw it. An enormous carcass, half hidden by the brush. Elk, at first glance, but something was wrong. It was torn to shreds, bones snap like twigs. I approached cautiously, heart pounding. That's when I saw the footprints. They were huge, bigger than any bear track I'd ever seen, with long, curved claws. A shiver ran down my spine. I radioed it in, and a search team arrived the next day. They followed the footprints deeper into the woods. We found another carcass, this one even more ravaged. It was clear that something powerful, something dangerous, was out there. My superiors ordered the trail closed, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I had to do something. I had to find out what was killing people in my park. Armed with my rifle and my ranger training, I started hiking the old trails on my days off. I moved quietly, scanning the trees, my senses on high alert. Days stretched into weeks. Saw nothing out of the ordinary, just deer, birds, the usual forest creatures. I was starting to think I was crazy, that those chilling footprints had been a hoax. Then, one afternoon, I heard it. A low growl, echoing through the trees. I froze, rifle raised. My heart hammered in my chest. Slowly, I turned. And I saw it. The creature stepped out from the shadows, its form massive and imposing against the backdrop of ancient trees. It was like a wolf, but taller, easily seven feet when it stood on its hind legs. Its pelt was filthy, a patchwork of black and brown fur. But those eyes, they held a terrifying intelligence. I squeezed the trigger, but the damn thing was too fast. It lunged to the side, vanishing back into the undergrowth. The silence that followed was deafening. I waited breathless, but the creature was gone. I stumbled back to my truck as fast as I could, hands shaking. Back at headquarters, I told them everything I'd seen. They didn't believe me. Even with the reports of missing people, the evidence of the ravaged carcasses, they said it was just an animal, maybe a grizzly bear. They ordered me to take some time off, said I was overworked and stressed. But I knew what I saw. I knew that something monstrous was lurking out there. I started carrying a sidearm, even off-duty. I moved to a new apartment, somewhere safer. But the fear never left me. I spent sleepless nights jumping at every creek, imagining the glint of those eyes staring in from the darkness. One rainy night, I was driving home from the grocery store. It was dark, and the headlights cut through the downpour. And that's when I saw it, running across the road, a flash of fur and teeth. I slammed on the brakes, barely missing the creature as it vanished into the trees. I sat there, heart pounding, rain dripping down the windshield. 
I knew it would only be a matter of time until it came for me. I got out of the car and walked to the edge of the woods, rain stinging my face. It was foolish, but I had to know. I shouted into the shadows, calling the creature out. Nothing. Silence, except for the steady drip, drip of the rain. Just when I thought the night couldn't get any stranger, I saw headlights approaching through the downpour. An old beat-up truck pulled alongside the road. The window rolled down, and a weathered face peered out. You all right, son? He had a gruff voice, tinged with suspicion. Yeah, I said, trying to sound steadier than I felt. Just encountered some wildlife. His weathered eyes narrowed. This time of night? You a hunter? Park ranger, I said, out patrolling, even in this mess. He chuckled, a dry, humorless sound. Always something weird in these woods, ain't there? He paused, a strange glint in his eye. You seen that, thing? Folks around here talk about. I hesitated. Was I about to confide in a complete stranger? But maybe he knew something, something that could help. I've seen something big, I admitted cautiously. Bigfoot, they say. He scoffed. Nah, something worse. Keeps to itself, mostly, but gets bolder now and then. A shiver ran down my spine, not just from the cold. This old-timer believed me. You know what it is? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. He shrugged. Feral dog, monster wolf, something unnatural. Been whispers of it for generations. His eyes bore into mine. Be careful, son. It ain't something you want to mess with. And then, as quickly as it arrived, the truck roared off, vanishing back into the rainy night. His words echoed in my head. I wasn't crazy. Something terrible haunted these woods. I went home, but I couldn't sleep. I sat at the window, shotgun in hand, staring out at the storm-tossed trees. The old man's warning nod at me. It wasn't just a threat to me anymore. It was something dark, preying on my entire jurisdiction. It had to be stopped. The next day, despite the protests of my superiors, I organized a search team. Not just rangers, but experienced hunters from the surrounding area. We were armed, determined, and ready to confront whatever lurked in the shadows. We followed the creature's tracks deeper into the woods than we'd ever ventured before. The forest seemed to grow denser, darker with each step. There was an oppressive feeling in the air, a sense of being watched. The footprints led us to a ravine, overgrown with thick brush. We cautiously fanned out, weapons raised. Then we heard it. Another growl, louder this time, echoing from within the ravine. The hunters and I exchanged nervous glances. We had it cornered. I gave the signal, and we crept toward the source of the sound. The creature lunged from the bushes with terrifying speed. It grabbed one of the hunters, a man named Tom, before he could react. It dragged him screaming back into the darkness. A single gunshot cracked through the air. We charged forward, blindly firing into the ravine. Frantic shouts echoed back to us. When the gunfire ceased, a terrible silence fell. Tom was gone. The only thing left was a trail of blood leading deeper into the ravine. Heart pounding, I led the group after it. The creature was injured, and it wouldn't get far. I was filled with a mix of fear and burning rage. It had killed one of ours, and it would pay. The blood trail led us to a cave entrance half concealed by tangled vines. We cautiously entered, flashlights cutting through the gloom. Inside, the stench of death hung heavy in the air. And there, in the far corner, illuminated by a sliver of light coming through a hole in the roof, 
was Tom's body. What was left of it? I gagged, bow rising in my throat. The creature had ripped him to pieces. His mangled remains were a testament to its monstrous brutality. And then it moved. A towering form rose from the shadows at the back of the cave, its eyes blazing with fury. It was more massive than I'd ever imagined, its fur matted with blood. A guttural snarl rumbled from its throat. We opened fire. The cave echoed with the roar of gunshots. The creature staggered under the onslaught but kept coming. One of the hunters screamed as it lunged, tearing him from the group. Another shot rang out, and the creature finally stumbled and fell. It lay there, its enormous body twitching, blood gushing from numerous wounds. It was over. We had killed the monster that had haunted those woods. But the cost, the image of what it had done to Tom, the fear in his eyes would forever scar my memory. We dragged the creature's corpse out of the cave. Word got out fast. Reporters, scientists, the curious, they all descended on our quiet park. It didn't bring Tom back. It didn't bring back the others who had vanished over the years. They studied the creature, took samples, debated its origins. But none of their theories explained the malice in its eyes. Some called it a cryptid, others a genetic anomaly. I knew what I saw raw, ancient evil given monstrous form. The park never reopened. It became a cursed place whispered about in hushed tones. I quit my job. I couldn't bear the sight of the forest anymore. Even now, I live in a city, surrounded by concrete and steel, as far from the shadows of the trees as I can get. But some nights, I hear the wind whistling through the high-rises, and I swear it sounds like a growl echoing through the darkness. No matter how far I run, I'll never truly escape the memory of what lurks in the wild places. This happened to me a few years ago, somewhere in rural Washington state. They say I'm lucky to be alive. I don't always feel that way. My name is Derek. I used to work as a surveyor, and I've got a wife and a kid who misses their daddy. Not the kind of thing you put on a resume, though. I was working a big project near Hartsville National Forest. The kind of place where, on a clear day, you swear you can see forever, and then the fog rolls in, and the world shrinks to a ten-foot bubble around your head. My partner was Neil, good guy, strong work ethic, not a lot of imagination. I was never the superstitious type. We were off the main access roads, marking potential logging sites for a timber company. Standard stuff. Our third day, we found something in the trees about a half mile from our truck. Looked like a pile of rags from a distance. Got closer, turned out to be a deer, or what was left of it. Not a pretty sight, but not entirely unusual. Predators gotta eat, right? Still, the way it was, torn open but hardly eaten, left me with a bad feeling I tried to ignore. Neil marked the coordinates, made a note on the GPS business as usual. We should have left then. Hindsight's a real kick in the pants sometimes. We kept going deeper. An hour later, we got to a clearing, the kind of place the maps show but reality forgets. Big, mossy rocks, one of those quiet spots that puts you on edge. Neil got out the survey equipment. I started with the measuring tape. I noticed something odd, a long, deep gouge across a rock face. It looked unnatural, like something with serious claws had made it. I mentioned it to Neil. He just shrugged. Bear, maybe? See, that's the thing about Neil, nothing ever fazed him. Then I saw movement, a flicker of darkness at the edge of the clearing. I nudged Neil, 
and he glanced over. For a frozen second, he saw it too. It was hunched on a rock maybe sixty yards away. It looked big, too big for a coyote. Stocky. Dark hair, too long and thick to be fur. For a moment it studied us, then it was gone into the trees, moving with a speed that defied everything I understood about the wilderness. Neil went after it. I mean, he started moving in that direction. That's the thing nobody believes. I didn't stop him. We were armed, we were trained, and we were getting paid to chart that damn forest. Logically, it made sense. The problem with logic is sometimes it runs headfirst into something that spits in its face. We tracked it easily. Broken branches, bits of fur caught on brambles. Every step felt wrong, not like a hunt, but like we were being led. Neil went first, rifle at the ready. I was ten feet behind, an idiot with a clipboard. The trees closed in. The silence got louder. I think that's when I knew something was about to go real bad. It happened so fast, yet it also felt like slow motion. Neil reached a patch of thick brush, moved to step around it, and then he was yanked out of sight. A roar, not a bear, not a cougar, something deeper and hungrier, cut through the air. I saw a flash of movement, massive, a shape my brain couldn't process. Neil screamed, a terrible, choking sound, and then silence. I don't remember dropping my gear. I don't remember running. All I remember is the blind, panicky sprint back to the truck, the taste of copper in my throat, and the certainty that it was behind me, just biding its time. I crashed through the undergrowth, tore myself to shreds, and burst out onto the logging road. The truck, blessedly, was right there. I fumbled with the keys, got inside, slammed the door shut. And there, at the edge of the trees, was a pair of glowing eyes, yellow, watching me. I stared back, breath ragged, heart a frantic drum in my chest. Those eyes and that impossible face, seared into my memory like a brand. The creature didn't move, just held my gaze, and I swear there was intelligence in them. Not animal cunning, but something colder, calculating. The truck wouldn't start. Battery, starter, I don't know what, but the sound of the engine turning over was a death rattle in that chilling quiet. I was trapped. Panic threatened to swallow me whole, but then, like a bolt from the blue, Neil. He was out there might be hurt, dying, no way was I leaving him. I grabbed my rifle, the only weapon I had left, and climbed out of the truck. Each step toward the forest was agony, a countdown to a horror I couldn't even put a name to. The creature was gone, vanished back into the green shadows. No sign of Neil, no sound, not even birdsong. Something about that supernatural stillness was almost worse than the snarls. I followed the broken branches, the trampled undergrowth, the trail of our idiotic pursuit. The silence pressed in, a suffocating weight on my chest. Then I found him. Not him, not anymore. What remained could barely be called human. My stomach turned, a sickening wave of nausea and grief rising in my throat. Neil, who made bad jokes and never complained about the early mornings, was now a collection of fragments scattered across the ground. I stumbled, retching, my whole body trembling. Everything in me wanted to flee, but then the rifle was in my hands again, the coldness of the metal a tiny anchor point in the raging storm of terror. That thing was out there. Whatever it was, it had done this. Revenge? Anger? Those emotions were too human. I couldn't fathom what it was, what it wanted, only that it had shattered everything I thought I knew about the world. I started tracking, moving with a primal focus I'd never known I possessed. 
The creature's trail was a thread woven through the forest's chaos. But it was there, a bent sapling, a swatch of matted fur, a clawed footprint in the soft earth. Survival instinct kicked in, pushing back the despair. I wasn't just prey anymore. I knew too much, saw too much. It had chosen me, or so it felt, and now it was my turn. The light started to die then. Hazy golden sunlight filtering through the trees turned to gray, then deep, thick dusk. Every creak of a branch, every scuttling of a squirrel, made me jerk the rifle up, my finger jittery on the trigger. Paranoia and exhaustion gnawed at the edges of my sanity. When night fully fell, it was a moonless, oppressive black. I huddled at the base of a tree, rifle cradled in my arms, and tried not to listen to the symphony of rustling, chittering, and distant howls echoing through the woods. Sleep was a dangerous luxury I couldn't afford. That night stretched on forever, my mind spinning wild theories. Was it a lone creature? A pack? Some unknown beast? Or something else? Every legend of monsters that lurked in the shadows of human consciousness danced through my head like grotesque puppets. At dawn's first glow, I pushed myself up, every muscle aching, my body a testament to the night's ordeal. I had a vague notion of backtracking, getting to civilization, getting help, but something held me back. Neil, the tattered remains in that clearing. I swore I'd make it pay for that. Tracking became obsessive. I lost hours, lost myself in the pursuit. Every mark, every broken branch, was a piece of a puzzle that I desperately needed to solve. It, whatever it was, became the center of my universe. I'd barely ate, barely slept, just a man consumed by the hunt, by a need to understand, or maybe to destroy. And one morning I found it. The clearing was familiar, the one where this whole nightmare began. But it wasn't empty anymore. At the edge of the trees stood the creature, its massive form a silhouette against the rising sun. It turned its head, those yellow eyes fixing on me. I raised the rifle and hesitated. It felt wrong now, somehow. A rifle was a human weapon, built for human conflicts. This wasn't a bear or a mountain lion. This was something primeval, defying reason. It had torn my world apart, but it was also a part of the wilderness, in its own horrific way. I lowered the gun. The creature didn't attack. It just watched me for a long, chilling moment, and then it was gone, melting back into the shadows as silently as it had arrived. I stumbled out of that forest, haggard and hollowed out. Rescue came, questions came, endless questions from disbelieving park rangers and police officers. Animal attack? Poachers? I kept my mouth shut. The half-truths I gave them sounded insane even to my own ears. The aftermath is what you'd expect. Nightmares that leave me drenched in sweat, the lingering stares when people notice my mangled hand, the doctors saved it, mostly. Nobody believes my story, of course. My wife looked at me like I was a stranger when I tried to tell her. Neil's family thinks he just wandered off and got lost. That's easier than the truth. This happened to me a few years back, just outside of Coeur d'Alene in Idaho. I'm a city guy born and bred, so when my outdoors a cousin Tristan said he was heading that way for a backpacking trip, I figured, why not? Needed a change of scenery from my cubicle life, you know? My name's Jonah. I work in IT, pretty ordinary stuff. Tristan was super eager about the trails up by the lake, said they were remote, not a lot of tourist traffic. I was all for that. 
After a hellish eight-hour drive from Seattle, we parked near a ranger station that had seen better days. It was late afternoon, so we decided to hike in a bit, find a clearing and set up camp for the night. Tristan, bless his adventurous soul, packed for a whole week out there. Me? I brought enough gear for a long weekend, and even that was pushing it on my back. The trail was tough. Not your beginner-friendly, well-maintained path at all. Lots of loose rocks, steep ascents, and by the time the sun was dipping below the tree line, I was ready to collapse. Tristan, of course, was still bright-eyed, talking about how the light filtering through the leaves was straight out of a fantasy novel. Dude should have been a poet, not an accountant. Just when I thought we might literally have to sleep on the trail, we stumbled into a clearing. Now, this wasn't any charming little campsite. It looked like a storm had whipped through. Trees toppled over, branches strewn across the ground, even a bit of what looked like an old shed ripped to pieces. Found myself hoping it was just bad weather, not some Bigfoot territory nonsense. Tristan, oblivious as ever, sets down his enormous pack and beams. Perfect spot, Jonah. A little fixer-upper, but we'll be cozy in no time. I swear, the guy finds optimism in everything. I'm about to make some sarcastic comment about his boundless cheer, when a sound stops me cold. A growl, low and rumbling. Tristan heard it too, his carefree grin melting away. We both scanned the trees, the shadows stretching and deepening. Probably a bear. Tristan's voice was less confident than usual. I wanted to believe him, but something in my gut told me we weren't dealing with your average woodland creature. I fumbled for the can of bear spray clipped to my hip. Had no idea if it'd even make a dent against whatever was out there, but it felt better than nothing. Tristan was grabbing a flashlight, shining the beam in every direction. The beam caught something about twenty yards away, a pair of eyes, reflecting yellow, just above some bushes. Too high to be a bear. Too wide set for any normal predator. My heart started hammering against my ribs. Let's slowly back away. I managed to choke out. Whatever that thing was, it felt wrong. I took a cautious step back, keeping my eyes fixed on the glowing orbs. Tristan followed, but tripped on a fallen log. Let out a muffled curse, loud enough to break the tense silence. The eyes surged forward, and that's when I saw it fully. Massive, easily seven feet tall, even hunched over. Covered in dark fur, with this long, wolf-like snout, but its legs, the way it moved, not like a bear or a big cat. It was too upright, the limbs almost human-like. For a heart-stopping moment, it just stood there, sizing us up. I couldn't make myself move, couldn't even breathe. Then, it let out a howl that sent shivers down my spine. Not the howl of a wolf or coyote, deeper, with a strange echo to it that sounded almost mocking, like it knew we were outmatched. Instinct took over. We turned and ran. Didn't bother looking back, just tore through the trees, the snapping of branches and my own ragged breath filling my ears. Tripped and fell countless times, my bad knee throbbing with every stumble. Behind us, I heard the creature crashing through the brush, the sounds of heavy paws thudding on the ground. Then I caught sight of the road. My lungs burned, my legs screamed, but I pushed myself harder. Tristan was a few steps ahead, fear lending him some uncharacteristic speed. We burst out onto the gravel, scrambling towards the truck. I heard a furious snarl, closer than I wanted. I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking like crazy. Tristan was yelling something, but I couldn't make it out over the pounding of blood in my ears. 
Just as I managed to yank open the driver's side door, I saw the creature bound out of the tree lean, its snout twisting into a ferocious grimace. The door slammed shut just as the creature lunged. I heard a sickening thud as its body slammed into the truck, the metal buckling slightly. I fumbled the key into the ignition, the engine roaring to life as the thing clawed at the windows. Tristan was shouting, Go! 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 I didn't need to be told twice. I slammed the truck into gear, tires spitting gravel as I sped off down the road. Looking in the rearview mirror, I saw the creature receding into the darkness, its yellow eyes blazing in the headlights. We didn't stop until we were miles away, some rundown gas station with a flickering neon sign. I collapsed against the steering wheel, trying to catch my breath. Tristan, face white as a sheet, fumbled for his phone. His hand was shaking when he held it up to his ear. No signal. Of course. It took a couple of hours for the shaking to subside enough for us to form a semblance of a plan. We drove all night, finally hitting a town big enough to have a police station just as the sun was coming up. Our story must have sounded insane, two grown men panicking about a monster in the woods. The cops were kind enough not to laugh in our faces, but their faces held that skeptical, humoring kind of expression. They asked us about missing persons reports in the area, even showed us some old photos. None of them matched. Sent a couple of rangers back with us to the campsite, just in case. They found nothing. No footprints aside from our own, no sign of struggle, no blood. Cops wrote it off as an animal encounter, told us to be more careful out there. We didn't bother explaining that no bear or mountain lion walks on two legs. Didn't tell them about the yellow eyes. They wouldn't have believed us anyway. That was almost five years ago. We moved on with our lives, tried to at least. Tristan got married, settled down in the suburbs, bought a minivan, the whole nine yards. He swore off the wilderness completely. Me, well, let's just say I don't sleep much anymore. I see those eyes every time I close mine. Hear the growls and those heavy, unnatural footsteps. Sometimes, I catch a whiff of that rotten, animal musk clinging to my clothes, even though I burned them all weeks after it happened. Move to a top-floor apartment in a brightly lit part of the city. Bars on the windows, two locks on the door. Bought myself a gun, even though I'd never shot anything larger than a soda can in my life. I take target practice, hand trembling the whole time. I know, deep down, it won't do crap if that thing ever finds me. But it's something, some semblance of control in a world that suddenly feels way too big and terrifying. I don't go hiking. Don't go camping. Hell, I barely leave my apartment except for work and the occasional grocery run when I absolutely have to. Friends stopped calling after my third or fourth round of rambling about, well, about the thing I saw. Don't blame them. If someone told me that story, I'd think they were nuts too. Therapists haven't helped. They give me meds for anxiety, but that only dulls the edge. My dreams are still a living hell. Twisted versions of that night, where I don't make it to the truck in time, where the creature's claws find purchase on my skin, tear me apart. I wake up screaming, drenched in sweat. Sometimes, I swear I feel the weight of it on me in those half-awake moments, its fetid breath washing over my face. There are days when I'm convinced it's out there, tracking me. That it knows— Maybe it's always known where I was. They say time heals all wounds. They're full of it. All the therapy and pills in the world won't erase what I saw. People talk about moving on after trauma, about building a new life. 
I wonder how the hell you do that when a piece of you is still stuck back on that dark trail, running for your life from a monster. Lately, though, a new thought has started to haunt me. Even worse than the nightmares, even worse than the constant fear. The idea that I'm the crazy one. That the stress, the lack of sleep, it all twisted something in my mind. Hallucinations. A psychotic break. It would be easier, wouldn't it? To believe I imagined the whole thing. But deep down, I know the truth. I know what I saw was real. Real as the cold sweat soaking my shirt right now, as the frantic thudding of my heart in my chest, as the gun I keep loaded under my pillow as I drift into another fitful sleep. This happened to me a few years back, on a trip I took out west. I'm a hiker by nature, love being out in the open air. Solitude, you know? My name's Caleb. Work a desk job most of the year, so those stretches in the wild feel like they save my soul. Up until then, I'd mostly stuck to well-known trails, national parks, that kind of thing but I started hearing whispers about a section of the Appalachian Trail that cut through Cherokee National Forest in Tennessee. Supposed to be beautiful, deserted, exactly my kind of thing. Found myself driving down there one crisp fall morning, practically giddy with anticipation. First day on the trail was everything I'd hoped for, sun filtering through the gold and red leaves, a light breeze rustling overhead. Saw a few groups of other hikers, but they thinned out fast as I made my way deeper into the woods. Second morning, felt like I had the whole world to myself. That's when the signs started. They weren't the usual park markers, but carved into trees with some kind of knife, crude circles, claw marks, symbols I didn't recognize. Tried to tell myself it was bored teenagers— or maybe even someone's art project, but the unease settled in my gut and wouldn't leave. Then, in the late afternoon, I came across something truly disturbing, a deer carcass strung up from a tree branch, its entrails spilling out. Some sick prank, I thought, hoping, despite the fact that there was no way a human could have hoisted that thing up so high. The next morning, I decided to start heading back. But the further I walked, the more of those damned symbols I saw. And the feeling of being watched, it pricked at me, like something was just out of sight in the dense trees. I picked up my pace, trying to shake the sense of dread. That afternoon, I reached a clearing ring by ancient pines. There, lying in the dirt, was the tattered remains of a backpack, with clothes and supplies strewn around it. My stomach plummeted. Every hiker knows, you don't leave your gear in the middle of nowhere. I cautiously scanned the trees. Then I saw it, a flash of movement just beyond the shadows. Before I could get a good look, a blood-curdling howl split the forest silence, a deep, guttural thing, unlike anything I'd ever heard. It echoed through the trees, seeming to come from all directions at once. My blood ran cold. I spun around, frantic, trying to see where it came from. Finally, my eyes locked onto a pair of glowing orbs set just above a row of bushes. Yellow-green, they burned through the gloom with a malevolent light. For a terrifying second, I was frozen, held by that eerie gaze. Then, the creature stepped out of the brush. It stood on its hind legs— easily seven feet tall. Its body was covered in dark, mangy fur that stood on end, its limbs powerful and muscular. The thing that haunts my dreams is its head, like a wolf stretched and twisted, snout elongated, full of razor-sharp teeth. It let out a low growl that rumbled in my chest, and that snapped me out of my fearful paralysis. I dropped my pack and ran, 
Branches whipped at my face, rocks cut my feet, but I didn't dare look back. Behind me I heard it crashing through the undergrowth, snarling and snapping its teeth. I stumbled onto a gravel road practically in tears. Relief washed over me until I saw the battered pickup truck parked by the side, empty. The sinking realization hit me like a physical blow. No help here. The woods closed in on either side. The forest had a new silence now, a tense, waiting kind. A twig snapped behind me. I whirled around, heart drumming a frantic beat. There it was again, looming closer, its eyes blazing like twin fires. Its lips pulled back in a grotesque grin revealing those horrifying teeth. I took off running down the road, the creature gaining ground, its paws pounding the dirt. I knew that inhuman speed would overtake me in seconds. A sob choked in my throat. Out of some desperate corner of my mind, an old hunter's tale surfaced, something my grandfather used to say about, silver. I fumbled in my pocket, praying, and pulled out a small folding knife, wedding gift from my wife, blade glinting dully. Pathetic I knew, but it was all I had. I spun to face the thing as it lunged. Time seemed to stretch out as I raised the knife, a single gleam of metal against a wall of teeth and fur. I aimed for the heart, more out of instinct than hope. The creature collided with me, a mass of fur and rage sending me crashing to the ground. The knife spun from my hand, disappearing into the leaf litter. My vision blurred as pain exploded across my chest, its claws tearing into me. I braced for the fatal blow. But instead of teeth in my throat, I heard a startled yelp. The creature jerked back, confusion momentarily flickering in its eyes. I clawed at the ground, trying to gain some distance. My fingers closed on the knife. In one ragged motion, I swung it upwards, slashing blindly. Something hot and sticky splattered my face. There was a howl of pain, and the weight on me abruptly vanished. I scrambled to my feet, knife still clutched in my shaking hand. Across the road, the creature was nursing a gash across its torso, bright blood staining its fur. It hissed in fury, its eyes narrowing. But something had shifted. Uncertainty flickered behind the rage. It circled me warily, but didn't fully charge again. Instead, it gave me one last hate-filled look and turned, disappearing into the dense undergrowth with an angry snarl. I stood there, half expecting it to burst out of the shadows again, but only the rustling leaves answered. When my legs stopped quivering, I stumbled back onto the dirt road. Every inch of my body screamed at me, but I forced myself to keep moving. I didn't stop until I burst out onto the highway, flagging down the first car that passed. Hospital stay was a blur. Infection, stitches, the same battery of questions from cops and park rangers. They didn't believe me, of course. Animal attack, they said. Bear, or maybe one of those feral hogs. Even showed me pictures. I could almost laugh. If any bear or hog looked like that, the whole world would know. When I was finally released, I drove straight home, slept for sixteen hours, and then went to work like nothing had ever happened. It was easier, safer that way. Told everyone I had a run-in with a wild animal, which wasn't even technically a lie. The nightmares weren't so bad at first. Just flashes of yellow eyes, the smell of wet dog clinging to me in my sleep. But they got worse. The creature began to twist and change in my dreams, growing more monstrous, more cunning. I'd wake up yelling, bathed in cold sweat, convinced the feel of its claws on me was real. I stopped sleeping for more than a few hours at a time, became a walking zombie at work. My wife, bless her heart, tried to get me to talk to someone. 
a therapist, anyone. I didn't have the words to explain. Didn't know how to say that I wasn't sure what was nightmare and what was memory anymore, that sometimes I'd catch my reflection and see, just for a second, something else staring back. Then came the news reports from Tennessee. Hikers disappearing without a trace. A hunter finding a mangled carcass up a tree, just like the deer I'd seen. Locals whispered about something big and vicious out there, but the official story stuck with bears gone rogue. I knew better. They haven't found any bodies. I lie awake most nights staring at the shadows playing on the bedroom wall, wondering whose name will be next in the news. And if someday, it'll be mine. The world feels so much bigger now, and so much more dangerous. I don't go into the woods anymore. Haven't even been to a park with my own kids. The wife thinks it's some kind of PTSD. Maybe it is, but sometimes I think I'm the crazy one. That I imagined the whole thing, that the fear broke something in my head. Almost. Except for the scars across my chest, too deep and ragged for any bear claw. And that knife, it's buried in a box in the attic. I can't look at it, can't bring myself to throw it out either. Because some stubborn, terrified part of me knows, there's a tiny gleam of silver embedded in the blade. Some nights, I think I hear a howl in the distance, that same blood-curdling cry that haunts my dreams. I tell myself it's just the wind, or a coyote, or a trick of the imagination. But the hair stands up on the back of my neck, and I can't escape the feeling that it knows I'm here that I survived, and that it's waiting. This happened to me a few years back, on a trip I'll never forget. I'm a hiker through and through. Love the outdoors, the quiet. City life gets a bit much sometimes, you know? My name's Elias. Work an office job that's about as exciting as watching paint dry. Anyways, I'd been hearing whispers about a trail up an Olympic National Forest in Washington State. The usual stuff circulated on those nature enthusiast forums. Remote, untouched, spectacular views. My kind of place. Took me a couple of days to drive up there. Found a small motel near the park entrance so I could get an early start the next day. Morning came crisp and bright. I loaded my pack, hit the trailhead before the sun had fully risen. The first few miles were a breeze, the kind of well-maintained path with little signs pointing out local wildflowers. Then, things started to change. The trail narrowed, the trees grew closer together their branches forming a tangled canopy overhead. Sunlight barely filtered through, making the forest feel dim and secretive. Found a rough campsite to the side of the trail. Fire pit. Some tattered remnants of old gear must have been some intrepid hikers that strayed from the beaten path. I didn't mind. Solitude was exactly what I was after. The afternoon passed in a pleasant rhythm of steady footsteps and quiet contemplation beneath the towering pines. I made good progress, and with a couple of hours of light left, figured I'd start scouting for a place to set up camp for the night. That's when things started to feel off. That sense of being watched, the tickle on the back of your neck. At first, I chalked it up to spending too much time alone in the woods. Told myself it was a deer or something. But then the sound started. Rustlings in the bushes, the snapping of twigs too heavy for any small animal. I stopped mid-stride, scanned the foliage. Saw nothing but twisting branches and deep shadows. Nerves on fire now, I quickened my pace. The sounds kept up, sometimes near, sometimes further as if whatever was out there was circling me. 
I finally found a decent campsite, a patch of level ground next to a stream. Tossed down my pack and whipped out my utility knife. The underbrush was thick here, perfect cover for anything that wanted to stay hidden. I started methodically hacking away at branches, trying to create a perimeter. The whole time, I had the sickening feeling that I was being observed. It was dusk by the time I got a small fire going, the flames barely chasing away the creeping shadows. I ate a quick dinner, the rustles in the bushes never ceasing. I kept a flashlight in one hand, the knife in the other. No way I was going to sleep. Then I heard it, a growl, a low rumbling snarl that cut straight through the other forest sounds. Something big was out there, close. I froze. For a long moment, it seemed like even the crickets had stopped their chirping. Suddenly, there was a crash of branches and I saw it. Huge, standing at least six feet tall, even slightly hunched over. Dark fur rippled over thick muscles. The head, that's what stuck with me. A wolf's muzzle stretched long, lined with teeth meant for tearing flesh. Eyes gleamed a poisonous yellow in the firelight. It stepped closer, the ground trembling beneath its paws. I bolted. I don't remember much about the next frantic minutes. Branches whipped my face, rocks cut my feet as I scrambled through the woods, the creature's grunts and the pounding of its feet echoing behind me. I came out at the edge of a ravine, slipping and tumbling down its slope, landing half-submerged in a rushing creek. The shock of the icy water brought me back to my senses. I staggered to my feet half expecting to see the creature lunge out of the darkness. There was nothing. Just the sound of the creek, my own ragged breathing. I don't know how long I hunkered there, shivering on the bank. I told myself to move, to follow the creek, eventually it'd have to lead back to civilization. But my legs were like lead, my body refusing to obey. Finally, as the first tendrils of dawn painted the sky gray, I heard the distant hum of an engine. A road. I somehow forced my trembling limbs to carry me through the brush, stumbled onto a dirt track just as an old pickup truck rattled past. Waved frantically, and the driver, startled, slammed on the brakes. He must have thought I was a man and hauled out of the woods, clothes torn, eyes wide didn't care. I scrambled into the truck, babbling about the thing I saw. The driver was a gruff logger named Hank, the kind of guy with forearms like tree trunks. He listened to my story, his face unreadable beneath a bushy beard. When I finished, he just nodded, tossed me a thermos of bitter black coffee, and gunned the engine. Drove me straight to a ranger station, and even came with me when I stumbled inside to tell my tale. The rangers, well, they were less receptive than Hank had been. I got the polite smiles, the We'll send someone out to look, routine. The whole time, I could feel their skeptical glances. And who could blame them? I sounded like something straight out of a bad horror movie. Hank stuck around long enough to see me patched up at the local clinic, cuts, bruises, and a mild concussion. Even gave me a place to crash for the night on a lumpy couch in his cabin. The next day, a ranger stopped by. Said they'd combed the area, found some disturbed undergrowth, but nothing else to support my claims. Looked at me like I was some kind of attention-seeking weirdo. Even Hank, bless him, just clapped me on the shoulder and said, Sometimes the woods play tricks on a man. Back home, the nightmares started. Every time I closed my eyes, I'd be back in that forest clearing, staring up at the creature. I'd wake in a cold sweat, its rancid breath hot on my face, those yellow eyes burning into mine. Doctors called it PTSD handed me prescriptions that did nothing to dull the edges of my terror. I stopped going outside. 
couldn't handle the sight of trees or the rustle of leaves in the wind. Hell, even the squirrels in the park across the street made my stomach twist into knots. Tried going back to work, but every shadowed corner of my cubicle sent a jolt of fear through me. Took a leave of absence, then another, and then just never went back. Became a recluse, ordering in everything I needed, the world shrinking to the walls of my small apartment. Lost touch with friends, family, anyone who might try to drag me out into the sunlight. Told them I was fine, just needed some time. They stopped calling eventually. The news report started a few months later. Up in the Olympic National Forest again. Disappearances. Hikers, campers, a couple of locals. The papers ran wild with its Sasquatch theories. Serial killers preying on the vulnerable. No bodies, no evidence, just the empty spaces left behind. And always, somewhere in those articles, they'd mention. Canine-like tracks, found at the edges of the search zones. My gut would clench every time I saw that phrase. I knew. They wouldn't listen to me, of course. No history of mental illness conveniently dismissed my rantings. But I saw what I saw. It's out there, growing bolder, smarter. The forest was its territory, but for how long? Sold my apartment for what little I could get. Used the money on a battered old van, the kind with no windows in the back. Reinforced the doors, stocked it with supplies. These days, I drift from city to city, parking in shadowed lots, staying just one step ahead of the paranoia that crawls over me like a spider. Sometimes I dream of confronting the creature. By a high-powered rifle, hunt it down. I imagine tracking it back into those woods, the righteous fury burning away the fear. In those dreams, I have a name for it a whispered legend from online forums, the furtive glances of those who half-believe, dogmen. But most days, I wake up to the cold reality that I'm the one being hunted. I haven't seen the woods in years, but I swear I can still smell the damp earth and rotting leaves. I feel its breath on the back of my neck, the weight of its yellow gaze. People talk about closure after a trauma. I'll never have that. No bodies for a funeral, no proof for a court case. Just me and the monster and an empty road stretching out into the darkness. This happened to me a couple of years back. Hard to believe it sometimes, feels like a lifetime ago. My name's Alex. I work construction, always have. Nothing glamorous, but it pays the rent. Me and a few of the guys, Pete, Rick, and Marcus, well, we do a hunting trip every fall. It's a chance to get away from the job site, the wives, everything, just sweat, beer, and a bit of good-natured ribbing. This time around, we decided on the White Mountain National Forest over in New Hampshire. Those ridges and old-growth trees make you feel like you're on another planet. First day, we set up camp on a bluff overlooking a river. The usual routine, pitch the tents, build the fire pit, crack open a few cold ones. The air was crisp, the sky clear. You'd get used to that city smog, forget what real stars look like. Marcus, always the joker, starts in on one of his campfire stories. Talking about skinwalkers and Bigfoot sightings in the area, that kind of stuff. Pete's giving him a hard time about it, which just eggs him on. Me and Rick just laughed. Nothing like city boys pretending they know the first thing about the wilderness. That night, I could have sworn I heard something outside the tent. Scratching sounds, maybe the rustling of branches. I wrote it off as a deer or something. Happens all the time on these trips. Second day goes by without a hitch. 
We stopped a few bucks but no clear shot, so we ended up just hiking and swapping stories by the fire. Third morning is when things start getting weird. We were about halfway up a trail when Marcus stops dead in his tracks. Hey guys, he says, his voice low. Smell that? We all sniff the air. There's a faint smell, kind of like wet dog, but sharper, more acrid. It takes a while for it to register, but once I do, my gut twists all wrong. That's not a natural smell. Then, Pete points to the ground. Tracks, he says. We crowd around. It's hard to make them out in the soil, but they're huge. Not bear-sized, and not hoof-shaped like a deer. They look more like, well, a giant dog print, with the claws sunk deep into the dirt. A chill runs down my spine. We all know what we're thinking, but nobody says it out loud. Should we head back? Rick asks nervously. Now, Rick is the biggest dude in the crew. Fearless kind of guy takes no crap from anyone. To see him like this, it set us all on edge. I clear my throat, try to sound more confident than I feel. Let's push on a bit more. It could be a stray. Keep your eyes peeled. We make it to our hunting spot with nobody saying a word. We fan out, but there's no sign of any game. The woods feel dead silent, like everything's holding its breath. After an hour, I give it up, signal to the guys that it's time to pack it in. As we're heading back, I glance over my shoulder. For a split second, I see a flash of movement between the trees. I whirl around but there's nothing there. The rest of the day, I couldn't shake that feeling of being watched. By the time night fell, I was ready to call it quits. I suggest we hike out the next morning, but Marcus and Pete, being stubborn as mules, insisted we stay. Just one more night, they say, maybe our luck would change. Worst mistake we ever made. We went to sleep early, but I lay there wide awake. Every little snap of a twig made my heart jump. Then it started, a strange howl, rising and falling, echoing through the trees. Nothing like a coyote or a wolf, this was deeper, more guttural. I heard Rick stirring in his tent, his voice shaky. What the hell is that? My throat was too tight to answer. Then it came again, closer this time. And with it, that same damn stench, like something rotten. There was a sudden rustling from Pete's tent, then a scream, cut off sharp. Marcus and I scrambled out, guns raised. Pete's tent was ripped to shreds, a pool of blood spreading out into the dirt, with his sleeping bag dragged off deeper into the woods. The three of us huddled together, guns shaking in our hands. We didn't speak, the silence broken only by ragged breaths and the thudding of our hearts. Then, the howling erupted again, louder, coming from multiple directions. We were surrounded. What do we do? Rick whimpered, his voice barely above a whisper. Panic threatened to swallow me whole, but a cold, primal instinct took over. Run! I choked out the word voice rough. Just run. We didn't need to be told twice. We bolted through the trees, blind with terror. Branches whipped our faces, rocks tore into our boots, but we kept running. I tripped, sprawling headfirst onto the ground, the sound of snarling at my back. Rolling onto my side, I saw it. The creature was monstrous. It stood taller than any man, hunched over on powerful legs, it's fur matted with dirt and blood. The head, that's what made my blood run cold. Stretched and narrow like a wolf's muzzle, but with rows of razor-sharp teeth. Eyes glowed with an unholy yellow light, fixed on me. It lunged. I barely managed to scramble out of the way, its claws ripping through my jacket. Behind me, 
I heard Marcus scream, a horrible gurgling sound. Didn't even have time to look back. Pushing myself up, I ran, tears streaming down my face. My lungs burned, my legs were lead, but the terror fueled me on. I burst through the tree lean and onto a dirt road, stumbling to a stop. Gasping for breath, I turned to see if the creature was following. Nothing. Only the silent, looming forest. I was alive. Barely. I made it back to the highway on numb legs, flagged down a truck. The driver called the cops, but my story of a monster in the woods earned me an overnight stay in the local psych ward. When the park rangers finally went to investigate our campsite, they found nothing. No remains of Pete or Marcus, no torn tents, no blood. The only evidence I had were the scars on my body and a broken mind. That was years ago. They never figured out what was out there, wrote the whole thing off as a wild animal attack gone wrong. But I know the truth. I saw that thing, smelled its foul breath, felt the heat of its eyes on my skin. People call me crazy now. Maybe they're right. Maybe this whole thing was just a nightmare brought on by grief and shock. But there's a part of me, a dark, terrified part, that knows better. Nights are the worst. I still hear Pete's screams, Marcus gurgling gasps as the creature dragged him off. My dreams are filled with glowing yellow eyes and the sickening stench of something that's not quite animal. I don't sleep much these days. I've got a gun stashed under my bed, even though I know deep down it won't help. If that thing is still out there, it'll find me again. I just don't know how to find it first. Sometimes the urge to go back to those woods gets so strong it's like a physical ache. Find the creature, confront it, make it pay for my friends. But then I remember that muzzle, those glowing eyes, and the feeling of being hunted. That raw, primal terror is what keeps me sane. Life didn't go back to normal after the White Mountains. I lost my job, my girlfriend. They couldn't handle this broken version of me. Nowadays, I drift from town to town, never staying too long. I take odd jobs, construction mostly, keeps my hands busy, my mind focused on something other than the howl. I drink more than I should, trying to numb the memories. But it never goes away. At every new job site, every empty bar, every lonely motel room, I feel them watching me. The yellow eyes in the shadows. The reek of wet fur and something unnaturally feral. It's only a matter of time until it decides to finish what it started. This happened to me a few years ago, down in the Angelina National Forest in Texas. I like to find the lesser-known spots for hiking. Fewer people that way. My name's Ezekiel Zeke to my friends. Bit of a loner, always have been. Out in the woods, it's just me and the trees, no office politics or drama to deal with. Anyways, this particular trail was a good one. Starts off with a steady climb, winds through stands of pines, then finally opens up near the top of a ridge for some pretty awesome views, especially at sunrise. I've been doing that hike for years. Knew it like the back of my hand. Or so I thought. This time, it was different. For one, I didn't see a single other hiker the whole day, which was unusual, even midweek. And the deeper I got into the forest, the quieter it seemed. Not just no people, no birds singing, no rustling of squirrels in the leaves. Made me feel uneasy, but I brushed it off. As the sun began to dip below the tree lean, I figured it was time to turn back. I'd been going for about six hours, and didn't want to risk navigating the trail in the dark. But that's when I realized I was lost. 
No idea how it had happened. I'd stuck to the main path, at least what I thought was the main path. But the trees, the way the light fell, nothing looked familiar. Tried not to panic. Started backtracking, looking for landmarks I might have missed. But the forest only seemed to get denser, the shadows longer. I took out my phone no signal. Of course. Cursing myself for not bringing a compass, I just kept walking, hoping to stumble onto something recognizable. Then, a sound cut through the silence, a low growl, just behind me. I froze. Slowly, I turned. And there it was. Not ten feet away, half hidden behind a tree, was this monstrous thing. I tell you, it looked like a dog, only twisted and wrong. Stood easily seven feet tall on its hind legs, with matted black fur that hung in clumps, and a snout that stretched out far past what nature intended. But the eyes, they were pure yellow, glowing like hot coals. They stared right through me. I stumbled back, tripped over a fallen log. For a heart-stopping moment, it just watched me, head cocked, like it was curious. Then, with a snarl that made the blood freeze in my veins, it lunged. I scrambled to my feet and ran. I don't know how long I ran, just that I didn't dare look back. Branches tore at my clothes, rocks scraped my palms, but the adrenaline numbed the pain. Finally, I stumbled into a clearing, just as the last bits of daylight faded. I collapsed onto the ground, gasping for breath, unable to go a step further. The sounds of pursuit had faded, but I heard something else now a steady drip, drip, drip onto the leaves. I looked down at my hands. They were slick with blood. Must have cut myself up good in the fall. Suddenly, the dripping noise stopped. Slowly, I raised my head. The creature stood just yards away, crouched low. Blood, my blood smeared its grotesque snout. I saw its muscles tense, ready to leap, and everything inside of me went cold. Then, a voice rang out, rough, from somewhere beyond the clearing. Hey there! You okay? A surge of hope, so fierce it ached, ran through me. Relief washed over me so strongly that I nearly slumped in place. I tried to scream, to wave my arms, but all I could manage was a weak croak. The creature twisted its head towards the sound, and for a second I saw something in its eyes, not fear, exactly, but something like caution. It turned and melted back into the trees with shocking speed. The man emerged into the clearing, rifle in his hands, a look of concern etched on his weathered face. Turns out he was an old hunter, had a cabin further down the ridge. He heard my thrashing in the brush, figured I'd run into a boar or something. Took me back to his place, patched me up, even gave me some food. Nicest guy you could imagine. When I told him what really chased me through the woods, well, he looked at me like I was crazy, but not unkindly. Hunters get used to tall tales, I reckon. Said he'd walk me out of the woods come morning. After I finally got to sleep that night, I heard it, a howl, drifting down from the ridge. Distant, but getting louder. The hunter must have heard it too, cause he came barging into my room, rifle raised, but there was nothing there. That howl chilled me far worse than being lost ever did. It felt like a promise. Next morning, the hunter walked me to the head of the trail. Just before I stepped back into the trees, he looked around nervously, then gruffly handed me an old-looking revolver. For peace of mind, he muttered, I didn't need persuading. Took it with shaky hands, and then plunged back into the woods. Never saw that hunter again, never went back to that forest. I still have the revolver. Most nights, the nightmares let me sleep. 
but sometimes I think I hear something padding around my apartment building late at night. A wet, snuffling sound. And on those nights, I put the gun under my pillow. Just in case. This happened to me a few years back, on a trip to Arizona. People head to the Grand Canyon for the views, but you want real wildness, you go to the Mogollon Rim. I'm Jared, by the way, construction worker from Texas. At least I was before all this. Bit of a tough guy reputation, a bit of a beer gut, not exactly the scared rabbit type, you know? Truth is, that trip was meant to be me time. My wife had her sister's wedding to wrangle, and our anniversary kind of got forgotten. Hit the road instead of buying flowers. Classic bonehead move I won't be repeating any time soon. Figured I'd do some camping, find a place to fish and drink where nobody could tell me to turn down the classic rock. First two days went to plan. Found a sweet little spot on the edge of the Coconino National Forest. Far off the beaten path, surrounded by pines and blessedly quiet. Seemed like I had the whole place to myself. Then, the third night, that's when things got weird. I'd finished dinner, had a few beers, standard routine. Just as I was drifting off by the embers of the fire, I heard something. Snapping branches, heavy footfalls circling my camp. I sat up hand near the hunting knife I'd been too lazy to put away. It sounded big, whatever it was. Bear maybe? We don't get those down south so much. Grabbed a burning branch, held it up like a torch. And that's when I saw it. For a second, just a second, it was caught in the firelight. Hunched over, but not on all fours. Too tall. Limbs too long to be a bear. Shaggy black fur slid close to its hide, and a head, not like any animal I'd ever seen. Muzzle long and lean, teeth shining, and eyes that glowed like embers themselves. Wolf? Something else? My brain didn't have the vocabulary for it. The fire sputtered, the thing was gone, vanished into the night. I barely slept. Clutching that knife, campfire blazing as bright as I could make it. Come dawn, I wasn't taking chances. I packed up my gear quick as you like, half figuring I imagined the whole thing in a beer fueled haze. Then I found the tracks. They weren't bear tracks, not cougar either. Big, clawed footprints, two legs, not four. Followed them for a while pure stupidity driving me more than good sense. They led deep into the trees, away from any trail. For some idiotic reason, I still figured it could be explained away. Maybe someone's weird dog got loose? Yeah, sure, a dog the size of a linebacker. I was nearing one of those deep ravines the rim is famous for. I was thinking about turning back when I heard the yelling. A woman's voice, faint, cut off quick like someone put a hand over her mouth. My blood ran cold. Whatever was out there, it wasn't just some animal. Got to the edge of the ravine. Below there was an old logging trail, and there was a park ranger's truck pulled over. No sign of anybody at a glance. Then I saw her, young woman with a ponytail, ranger uniform being dragged into the bushes by, by that thing. It was massive, at least seven feet tall, muscles rippling under that awful slick fur. Had her pinned down, jaws open, and in the light filtering through the trees, its teeth looked freakishly long, not like a dog's at all. I did something stupid. Something reckless. I yelled, ran towards them waving my arms like a maniac. I figured make noise, distract it, give her a chance. It worked, sort of. The creature whipped its head round, snarling. The woman scrambled up, bolted. 
I didn't see where she ran off to. All that was left was me and it, twenty feet between us. Those eyes narrowed, focused on me. It stood up straighter, and I swear, it almost seemed to be sizing me up. That's when I broke. I don't mean I cried or nothing dramatic. I mean something inside me just snapped clean in two. I turned and ran like I'd never run in my life. I heard it give chase, those awful loping strides gaining ground fast. The ravine, the trees, everything was a blur. Somehow, and I honestly don't know how, I got to the truck. Fumbled keys, got the engine started. The thing burst from the tree line, and for a frozen second, I looked into its eyes again, and I saw something behind them that chilled me worse than the hunger. Intelligence. Calculation. I slammed the truck in gear, peeling out in a shower of gravel. I didn't look back until I hit the main highway. No sign of the creature, no sign of the ranger woman, not a damned soul but me. Drove to the nearest town, told them everything. Search party went out, found nothing. Nobody believed me, course not. They wrote it off as a bear attack, maybe a mountain lion. Said the woman probably wandered off, injured and disoriented. Maybe she did, but I don't think so. This happened to me a few years back, when I was still living in Montana. Big sky country, right? Gorgeous, but rugged. Me, I'm not the outdoors type, more into computers than campfires. But that summer, my buddy Tristan, he was obsessed with exploring all these old abandoned mines in the mountains. Finally talked me into going with him. My name's Jared, by the way. Figured I'd get that out of the way. So, we packed our gear, flashlights, ropes, the whole bit, and drove out to this place he'd found. It was a long trek from the highway, down a dirt road, then on a trail that basically disappeared into the trees. We reached the mine entrance around midday. It was dark, gaping hole in the hillside, a few rotting timbers propping it up. Gave me the creeps but Tristan was practically bouncing with excitement. He insisted we head down right away. The first section of the mine was rough but navigable. Old tracks, piles of broken equipment, damp rock walls. Tristan, of course, had to start with all the stories about what could be lurking down there. Mountain lions, escaped convicts, who knew what. I just rolled my eyes. We went deeper, and the tunnel got narrower. Tristan was shining his light ahead, pointing out weird rock formations, going on about veins of ore. The air got thick and stale. My cell signal was long dead. That, finally, started getting to me a little. We reached a spot where the tunnel forked. Tristan chose the left path, but something stopped me. My phone flashlight wasn't the greatest but there was enough light to pick something up, movement in the right-hand tunnel. A flicker of eyes, reflecting yellow, that seemed too big, too far apart. Then a growl, low and guttural. Tristan, wait! I started to back away. He glanced back, annoyed. What's up with you, man? Then he saw what I was looking at. The look on his face was priceless, that overconfident bravado gone in a second. The thing stepped out then. Shaggy, hunched, taller than a man should be. A massive head with a pronounced muzzle, filled with teeth way too long. Tristan let out a yelp, and we both spun to run. It charged with a speed that defied its size. I heard Tristan yell, a shriek cut short. I didn't look back. Just ran, crashing blindly through that narrow passage, the thing's snarls hot on my heels. I stumbled, hitting the wall, my flashlight flying from my hand. 
plunged into utter darkness. I fumbled, feeling along the rocks, trying to keep going. Then a light flickered ahead, Tristan's big, fancy one. He was crouched further on, looking back at me, face white. Keep moving, he shouted, and we took off again. I don't know how far we went, just that my chest hurt, my breath rasping. We burst into a larger chamber, moonlight spilling in through a hole in the ceiling. I stopped, panting, scanning wildly for an exit. No use. We were cornered. The thing stepped into the chamber, blocking the tunnel entrance. Its chest heaved, hot breath steaming. It eyed us, head tilting, seeming almost curious. Then, with another snarl, it lunged. Tristan pushed me back, yelled for me to run, and pulled out this huge freaking hunting knife he had. Completely insane to face that thing with a knife, but braver than I'd ever be. The fight, if you can call it that, was short. There was a blur of motion, claws raking, the sickening sound of tearing. Then just whimpers fading fast. I stood there, frozen, listening to my friend die. And when it was quiet, when only the thing's ragged breathing remained, that's when I finally bolted. I scrambled up the rock pile where the moonlight came through, squeezed out into the night. Ran blindly through the trees, back down the trail. Burst out onto the dirt road and sprinted until I collapsed. Didn't flag down a car until dawn broke. The cops came, of course. Searched the mine, but found nothing, no trace of Tristan. I went back to that place a few times with larger groups, armed guys. We never found a sign of the creature, nothing to explain what happened. Most people assume I made it up, or had some kind of breakdown out there. Honestly, I wish that was true. But I know what I saw. People don't vanish into thin air, and whatever killed Tristan, it wasn't any bear or wildcat I've ever seen. Some nights, I think I hear it outside my window. That same low growl. I keep telling myself it's probably a stray dog. But I also keep a loaded shotgun under my bed, just in case. This happened to me a few years ago, down in the Ocala National Forest in Florida. Not exactly the most popular spot, which is what drew me to it. I like exploring places off the beaten path. My name's Wyatt. I'm a photographer by trade, mainly landscape stuff, trying to capture that untouched, wild beauty. The Ocala has a reputation, dense subtropical jungle, sinkholes, swamps teeming with gators. Folks go missing there with unsettling regularity. The news reports always focus on the gators or getting lost, but there's an old whisper about something else lurking in those trees. A tall, hairy creature seen darting between the shadows. Locals blame it for the disappearances, but the stories get chalked up to old folklore or the ravings of some guy who's had too much moonshine. Me, I never buy into the whole Bigfoot thing, but you get out there, surrounded by those ancient live oaks draped with Spanish moss all twisty and gnarled like something out of a nightmare, and you start to wonder. Anyway, I'd been camping in the forest for a couple of days, getting some great shots. One afternoon, I followed a little deer trail off the main path, trying to find a different angle on a huge cypress tree I'd had my eye on. The deeper I got, the thicker the vegetation grew. Finally, I came to this weird clearing not natural, it looked like something had been torn out of the jungle. Uprooted trees lay splintered on the mossy earth, the bark stripped off in chunks, and this awful smell, not exactly rotting, but sour and sharp, kinda made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Then I saw them. 
Footprints sunk deep in the mud, big, with long toe marks, but not quite human. My first thought was bare, but these looked different, somehow. Curiosity got the better of me, despite the prickle of unease down my spine. I followed the tracks, and then I heard it, a low growl that rumbled up from my gut more than through my ears. That's when common sense finally kicked in. I turned and ran. Stupid, I know, to run from an unknown predator, but panic had a death grip on me. I didn't think, just reacted. Behind me, I heard branches snap, something crashing through the brush, the growls growing louder. I pushed myself past my limits, lungs burning, legs wobbling like a newborn colt, but it was gaining on me. I finally burst through the trees onto a dirt road. Lungs heaving, I scanned the area, no cars that I could hotwire, no houses anywhere nearby. The forest stretched out on one side, the road on the other, and from the shadows it emerged. The first thing I noticed was the smell, like a wet dog, only intensified a thousand times over, with that same acrid, musky undertone. And the size? This thing dwarfed any bear I'd ever seen. Easily seven feet tall, even hunched. Shaggy fur covered its body, matted and dirty. But it was the head that lodged itself in my nightmares, like a wolf stretched out long, full of glistening fangs. Its eyes burned into mine, not animal yellow, but a bright, toxic acid green. It snarled, saliva dripping in threads from its open mouth. My camera hung around my neck, a useless weight. I knew instinctively that snapping a shot was a death sentence. It tensed to spring, and I couldn't look away, frozen like some rabbit paralyzed by a snake. But then, a truck roared into view, tires kicking up dust, honking its horn. The creature flinched, its eyes flickering between me and the vehicle. The hesitation was long enough. I sprinted towards the road, waving wildly, praying they'd see me. The truck slammed to a halt. A middle-aged couple peered out at me, their eyes wide. Help! I gasped out. Get me out of here! I didn't bother explaining, just hurled myself into the truck bed, scrambling to slam the tailgate closed. The thing roared in rage from the treeling, pacing the edge of the woods. I heard a growl vibrate through the metal of the truck. The truck lurched forward, the driver yelling something at me, but I couldn't make out his words. I just stared at the spot where the creature stood, its form blurring as we picked up speed. Finally, blessedly, it faded from view. I stayed huddled amongst the dusty tools in that truck bed until we reached the nearest town some fifteen miles away, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm. I never went back to the Ocala after that. Sometimes I regretted part of me itches to return, to try to document the proof. But then I remember that smell, those green eyes, and the feeling of being nothing but prey. That primal terror was enough to last a lifetime. This happened to me a few years back, on a trip to Alaska. Call me Rowan. I was working construction in Anchorage at the time. Needed some time off after a rough season, so I rented a camper and figured on exploring that Denali wilderness everybody talks about. Guy needs some mountains after too much of the city, right? First few days, it was everything the brochures promised. Glaciers, bears and that big empty feeling you get in places so wild. I had the whole campground mostly to myself, set up by a lake, did some fishing. All real National Geographic stuff. Then, the third night, I woke up to scratching at the camper walls. Sounded like nails on metal, high-pitched, and kind of frantic. I froze, thinking about those grizzlies they warn you about. 
I grabbed a flashlight, cracked the window to peek out. No bear, that's for sure. But what I saw, it ain't right. Crouched under a tree not twenty feet away was the biggest damn wolf I'd ever seen. Even in the half-light, it was huge, easily six feet at the shoulder if it stood up. But here's the thing, it didn't look natural. For too dark, almost black, and its head, the snout was too long, the eyes, wrong color somehow. I fumbled for my phone to get a picture, but when I looked back, it was gone. I didn't sleep much after that. Next morning, found tracks all around the camper. Big ones, but not quite bare paws, and only two legs. It was walking upright, whatever it was. Should have left then, but something in me, some stupid stubborn part, wanted to stay. See if I could track it down, explain it away. That was how I ended up miles off any trails, following those oversized paw prints through the dense spruce forest. Sun got low, the air took on that eerie stillness you get before dark in those parts. The tracks led deeper, and a feeling prickled on the back of my neck, feeling of being watched. I wasn't imagining it. Up ahead, half hidden in the low branches of a spruce, there it was. The creature, staring right at me. Its form was clearer now, tall, lanky, covered in that dark, matted fur. Its muzzle was like a wolf's but stretched out, its teeth bared in a snarl that wasn't quite animal. And the eyes, they glowed yellow, reflecting the fading light. It was more than a predator, there was a cunning in those eyes that chilled me worse than any sub-zero wind. I did what any sensible person would do then. I turned and ran. Didn't look back, didn't care if I tripped or broke a leg, just ran blind through the trees until my lungs screamed and my legs gave out. Then I crawled, scrambling over roots, the darkness closing in. Somehow, and I don't know if it was luck, blind panic, or something else, I found the old logging road I'd half noticed on the way out. Stumbled back along it towards the distant lights of the camper, hearing the rustle of movement somewhere parallel in the thick forest. It was toying with me, I realized. Hunting me for sport. The camper was a beacon then, the only hope in that vast wilderness. It felt like hours getting there, though it must have only been a few. Fumbled with the keys, got inside, slammed the door shut. Through the filthy windshield, those yellow eyes stared at me, unblinking. The camper shook as the creature circled, trying to find a way inside. It didn't leave. All night, I listened to those claws scraping, the guttural moaning sounds. I barely breathed, terrified it would catch my scent. Near dawn, the noises finally stopped. I waited until the sun was high before I dared to stick my head out. The tracks led off into the trees. It was gone for now. I packed up faster than I'd done anything in my life, left half my gear behind. Drove straight out of there, didn't stop till I was on the outskirts of Anchorage. Nobody believed me when I told them. Rangers said wolves ain't native to that part of the park. Some tourists said they'd seen a big black dog lurking around. Wrote it all off as me being sleep-deprived, maybe seeing things in the spooky woods. But I know what I saw. They say there are old stories around here, about creatures that hunt in the wild places. Legends about things not quite animal, things the locals called dogmen. Never paid them no mind before, sounded like fairy tales for kids. Now, well, now sometimes I wake up at night, feeling eyes on me in the dark, feeling watched. And I wonder, did it follow me home? This happened to me a few years back when I was working a summer up near the Boundary Waters in Minnesota. Beautiful area, all woods and lakes, 
but kinda lonely for a city girl like me. They put me up at an old forest service outpost for fire monitoring duty. My name's Kira, by the way. I liked the solitude at first. Spent days in that watchtower scanning the horizon for smoke, nights curled up reading by the fire. It got a little, prickly sometimes, feeling like the only person for miles. But hey, paid the rent, right? After a couple weeks, I got the sense I wasn't as alone as I thought. Started with small things. I'd swear I heard footsteps around the cabin at night, but there was never anyone there. Food would go missing from my supplies, things would be out of place when I came back from patrol. I figured it was some kind of animal, maybe a raccoon getting clever. Made sure to seal everything up tight. Then, one evening, I was coming back from the lake after a swim when I saw it. Something big slinked across the clearing and into the trees. At first glance, I thought it was a wolf, but too massive, and the way it moved, wrong somehow. I got a chill that had nothing to do with being wet. When I told the folks on the radio back at headquarters, they mostly laughed. Said I'd been spending too much time alone in the woods. One of the guys with a gruff voice jokingly told me to watch out for Bigfoot. Still, they send up a ranger named Harlan a day or two later to check things out. Harlan was an older guy, Native American, with the kind of face carved out of old wood. He listened to my story without cracking a smile. Then we took a walk around the cabin and down towards the lake. Sure enough, he found tracks, bigger than any wolf prints I'd ever seen, with long claw marks. Muttered something under his breath in a language I didn't recognize. Then said low and serious, This ain't no animal I know. Think you might be better off reassigned to a busier station. Didn't argue with that. Turns out reassignment wasn't that simple. A storm rolled in that night, knocked out communications. Harlan said to sit tight for a few days and we'd try again when the weather cleared. We hunkered down in the cabin, the rain pounding on the roof. Made some awkward small talk, trying to break the tension. That night, it came for us. I woke up to a terrible snarling sound. The cabin was shaking. Harlan was already up, shotgun in hand. He looked out the little window, face grim. Stay down, he told me, his voice tight. I crouched behind the table, heart thundering. I heard Harlan shout, the shotgun blast echoing through the night. There was a roar of pain, then more snarling, closer this time. The banging against the cabin walls was deafening. Something slammed into the door, once, twice, three times. The wood groaned ominously. I clutched a fire poker, my only weapon, and tried not to whimper in terror. Harlan fired again, and there was a yelp that cut off abruptly. Then silence. Just the sound of dripping rain and our ragged breaths. I don't know how long we stayed there, huddled in the half-darkness. Finally, Harlan whispered for me to stay put while he opened the door a crack. I saw moonlight glinting on rain puddles. Nothing out there. I crept towards the window and peered outside. The ground was torn up around the cabin, the tracks huge in the mud. But the creature, whatever it was, had vanished. Harlan didn't bother with the radio that morning, just helped me pack. We hiked out in the drizzling rain. As we neared the main road, I looked back, saw the cabin nestled alone at the edge of the woods. Couldn't stop myself from shivering. Found a ride with a logging truck back to civilization. Never went back to that outpost. When I tried to tell folks at headquarters what happened... They gave me those looks people give the crazy lady. So I quit. Headed back to the city, glad for traffic noise and crowded sidewalks. Most days, I can convince myself it was a bear, or a weird trick of the light. 
but some nights. I lie awake, and I see the cabin in the moonlight, the tracks in the mud. And I hear that snarl in the darkness, those claws against the door, and I know, something monstrous was out there that night, something that walked like a man, but had the hunger of a beast. This happened to me a few years back, when I was working construction in Alaska. Wild place, that one. Most of the crew stayed in bunks near the work site on an old logging road. Me, I liked being alone, so I got permission to camp down a ways deeper in the woods. Figured bears were more of a risk than people up there. My name's Finn, by the way. First week was uneventful. Worked hard during the day, slept like the dead at night. That all changed one evening when I was coming back to my campsite after dark. I heard a noise in the trees, like something was following me. Figured it was a moose or a deer, so I didn't think much of it. I reached my camp clearing. That's when I saw it. Huge shape hunched by the fire pit, dark against the flames. My mind flashed to bears, but the second the thing turned to look at me, I knew it wasn't any bear I'd ever seen. It stood on two legs, tall as a man, maybe taller. Shaggy fur covered its body. The head was all wrong, big pointed ears, elongated snout filled with sharp teeth. Its eyes reflected the firelight, burning a bright yellow. A guttural growl rumbled in its chest. I froze. Adrenaline spiked through me. The creature lunged, and I turned and bolted into the trees. I ran until my lungs burned, until I tripped and fell headlong to the ground. Lay there, gasping for air, listening. I could hear it crashing through the underbrush, getting closer. I fumbled for my pocket knife, a puny thing against a monster like that. It snarled, the sound echoing through the night. Then, another sound, a vehicle engine getting closer. Headlights cut through the trees, and I saw a beat-up old truck barreling down the logging road. The creature hesitated, then turned and melted back into the darkness. The truck screeched to a halt beside me. Two men hopped out, rough-looking types, carrying rifles. Turned out they were brothers, Trappers named Arrow and Tavi, who lived in a cabin nearby. They'd heard a commotion and came to check it out. I mumbled out my story as they helped me up, didn't think they'd believe me. But then Arrow nodded grimly. Heard tales, he said. Old native legends about those things. Skinwalkers some call em. His brother Tavi spat on the ground, then looked at me hard. Reckon you're lucky. Most folks don't walk away after meeting one. They drove me back to their cabin, got me some whiskey to calm my nerves. Told me everything they knew about the creatures. Vicious things, stronger than a bear and twice as clever. Said silver bullets might hurt them, but nothing else would. I didn't sleep a wink that night and I didn't much care that my construction buddies laughed when I told them what happened. I'd seen the look in the Trapper Brothers' eyes, and I wasn't about to take any chances. Spent the next few nights bunking with the other crew, jumpy as a spooked rabbit. Then I got permission to head down to the nearest town for a few days, needed to get supplies anyway. In the general store, I picked up some silver ammo for the shotgun I never bothered to bring with me before, then found a guy to melt down some old silverware I had and molded into bullets for my pistol. Never was one to believe in the supernatural much, but out there, under that vast Alaskan sky, you learn to keep an open mind. When I got back to the work site, the creature was waiting for me. It snarled in the darkness at the edge of the camp, watching. After that, the attacks grew bolder. It ripped up my tent, stalked me on the trails, and howled outside the bunkhouse some nights. 
The other guys in the crew were getting nervous, even though most of them still wouldn't believe my story. One night, it came after one of the crew, a guy named Declan. He'd gone out to take a leak, didn't come back. We found him in the morning, or what was left of him, out in the trees. It had torn him apart. That was it for most of the crew. They quit, foreman included. Aero and Tavi helped me pack up, and we all headed down to civilization. Didn't look back at that logging road once. I carry those silver bullets with me to this day. Some nights, I think I hear a snarl on the wind, and I check that the doors are double locked, even though I'm back in the city now. That thing out there in the wilds, it changed me. Made me realize there are some parts of the world man ain't meant to tame, some shadows where we don't belong. This happened to me a few years back, when I was working construction in Wyoming. It's one of those places people forget about, big sky, empty spaces. We were building a pipeline miles from the nearest town. My name's Brooks, by the way. City guy, originally. But the pay was good, so I figured I could put up with a little boondocks living for a while. The crew stayed in trailers out by the worksite. Kind of isolated, but we had all the necessities. One night, after a long shift, I was walking back to my trailer when I saw it. Something big, slinking along the edge of the camp. At first, I thought it was a huge dog. Then it stood on its hind legs, silhouetted against the moon. Too tall, too lean, and the head, all wrong. I froze, heart pounding in my chest. It sniffed the air, then turned its head to look right at me. Its eyes glowed, yellow in the moonlight. A low growl rumbled from its throat. I turned and ran. Heard the thing charging after me, heavy paws pounding the dirt. I burst into my trailer, slammed the door shut, and deadbolted, hands shaking. Peered out the window, saw it circling the trailer for a few moments, snarling. Then it vanished back into the night. I barely slept. The next morning... I told the foreman what had happened. He smirked, said I'd been hitting the cheap whiskey too hard. None of the other guys believed me either. Started thinking I might have imagined the whole thing. That changed a few days later. One of the crew, a guy named Flynn, didn't show up for work. We figured he was hungover. Then his empty trailer was found. It was trash, blood splatter everywhere and massive claw marks on the walls. No sign of Flynn. Search party went out, cops got called, the whole deal. They never found him. Never figured out what happened, officially. But I knew. And after that, the vibe shifted on the site. People got nervous. The night noises seemed louder, the shadows seemed deeper. A couple of the guys swore they saw something watching the camp, but nobody wanted to admit what it might be. We started working in pairs, never went out alone. Floodlights stayed on all night around the site. I got myself a gun, even though I'd never fired one outside of a video game. The sense of something terrible lurking out there only grew stronger with each passing day. Then... There was the night it came to the fence line. We were huddled in the canteen trailer after work. All of a sudden, the floodlights flickered and went out. The place was plunged into darkness. We heard it then, pacing back and forth along the fence, growling. It sounded massive. Someone tried turning the lights back on. Nothing. Then came a scream from outside cut abruptly short. Panic broke out. We huddled in the center of the trailer, clutching makeshift weapons. I had my gun, hands trembling. 
I knew that flimsy trailer wasn't going to stop the creature for long. The snarling just outside the thin wall grew louder, more enraged. We waited, breath held. I don't know how long passed, minutes, hours. Gradually, the noises faded, until there was only silence. We didn't dare move until dawn broke. Creeping outside, we saw the carnage. The fence was ripped apart. More blood, and something else lying nearby. A wolf's carcass, bigger than any wolf I'd ever seen, its throat torn out. That was our breaking point. The foreman called the company, said we weren't safe. They pulled the whole crew off the project. I left Wyoming that same day and never looked back. Some folks might not believe me, might say I made it up. The cops wrote it off as a mountain lion or a bear even though the evidence didn't match. But ask anyone who worked on that pipeline if they recall what happened, and they'll go quiet, get that haunted look in their eyes. We all know what lurks out there in the wilds, things most people write off as myths. After that, I don't look at the woods the same. At night, if I hear a howl that sounds off, a chill goes through me. There was something out there in Wyoming, something old and hungry. And I reckon it's still out there, waiting. This happened to me a few years back, back when I was still driving trucks for a living. Name's Mac. People say it suits me. Bit on the burly side, bit of a temper never been a guy to back down. Long-haul routes were my thing. Nights on the interstate, country music on the radio, and me with nothing but the road and my thoughts. It's lonely work, but a man can get used to it. This particular haul was down to Louisiana, taking a load of timber. Back roads for the final stretch, the kind you'd think nobody lived on except maybe those hermits you see on the news with yards full of rusted-out cars. Sun going down fast, headlights cutting through the thick forest, it gave me the creeps, honestly. But I had a schedule to keep. Then, there it was in the road up ahead, deer, right in the middle of my lane. Big buck, too nice a rack to kill outright. I slammed the brakes, semi-swerved, missed the deer by a hair and that's when I went into the ditch, deep, muddy ditch. Semi got stuck good and proper, and I knew right then, no cell service, no way to walk out of there before morning, and a load I couldn't leave unguarded. Damn near cursed myself blue. Night fell like a stone. I tried to relax, get some sleep, but every rustle of leaves, every creak of the truck had me jumping. This wasn't city nerves. The woods felt wrong. Still and silent one minute, then a flurry of something moving too fast to spot, and a low growl that set my hair on end. Come dawn, no help came by. No use sitting around, best to figure a way to get the rig rolling. That's when I saw the blood. Not on the truck, not on the deer carcass I finally spotted half dragged off, but splattered on the ditch wall, streaks of it leading deeper into the trees. Something big had been there, and it hadn't been gone long. Now, my daddy raised me better than to abandon my truck. But that blood, it gave me a real bad feeling. Grabbed my tire iron for good measure and went on the defensive. Followed those streaks of red, thinking I might scare off whatever it was. Should have turned back, plain as day now, but then pride's a powerful stupid thing cleared a bend, and there was the source of the blood. What was left of a man in hunter's gear, not just killed, but torn to pieces. Worst mess I ever saw, and I'd been down roads where accidents happened. And standing over it, the creature. You hear the stories, sure. Bigfoot, dogman, whatever folks want to name it. I never believed it. Until then. This thing, 
It was on two legs, easily seven feet tall, covered in thick dark fur, but not an ape's fur. Rom shaped to its limbs, Rom way it stood. The head, that's what stuck with me, a wolf's muzzle stretched long, and eyes that glowed like damn hot coals. Pure panic kicked in, fight or flight didn't matter. I yelled, swung the tire iron, dumb as dirt. The thing looked at me, not surprised, more like curious. Then it lunged. I barely dodged, rolling, scrambling back, that iron no better than a twig against it. I don't remember much after that. Running, blind terror fueling me, branches whipping my face. I must have stumbled onto some kind of path, because the next thing I knew, I was bursting from the tree line back onto the road. Didn't stop. Flagged down the next car dumb luck sent my way. Told them about the crash, about the creature. They looked at me like I'd sprung a leak in my head. Maybe I had. Cops arrived. Found the truck easy enough. Searched for the hunter. Never found a trace. Wrote me off as some trucker whacked out on fumes and loneliness. Didn't much care what they thought. Quit my job not long after. Took a while to sleep without seeing those eyes. Took even longer to drive by a stretch of woods without getting the shakes. Some folks say I just saw a bear, maybe gone rabid. Some say it's all a lie, the ramblings of a man who cracked under pressure. Maybe they're right. All I can say for sure is there are things in those dark places that we ain't meant to understand. And if you see a stretch of road that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up, hell, maybe just turn around. Your schedule can wait. This happened to me a few years back, on a hunting trip down in the Ozarks. Call me Vance. I'm an electrician by trade, but my heart's always belonged to the woods ever since I was a kid. Those deep forests, man, they get in your blood. Problem is, everyone else I know prefers deer season to spooky stories. This particular year, I was itching to go further in, track something different. My buddy, Kellen, said I was crazy for going alone. Then again, Kellen gets antsy if he's more than a mile from the nearest gas station. Figured a few days of solitude was exactly what I needed. Packed my gear, drove myself to the trailhead where I'd planned on getting dropped off by Kellen. First day was uneventful, the good kind of uneventful. Clear skies, birdsong, even glimpsed a bobcat, which was a treat. By the second day, I was miles in, deeper than most folks like to venture. The forest changed character out there. Trees grew denser, light got that greenish tinge. Had that feeling in my gut the one that says you ain't the top of the food chain anymore. Set up camp by a creek, just as the sun was getting low. Started a fire, got supper cooking, and that's when I heard it, the howling. Started out faint, carried on the wind. Wolf, I figured at first, maybe a lone one wandered south. Then it came again, louder and wrong. A wolf's howl has a certain cleanness to it, a wildness. This was rougher, with an undertone that made my skin crawl. Fire didn't feel like enough protection, suddenly. Scraped dirt over it, doused it with water to kill any lingering embers. Didn't want to attract any attention I didn't need. Huddled in my sleeping bag, rifle in hand, and tried to get some rest. Next morning, the first thing I checked was my campfire. The ashes were scattered, the ground churned up. Found tracks then, not wolf paws. Bigger, more like a heavy dog but with only two toes. My stomach turned. Kellen been right. I wasn't alone out there. I was halfway to packing up camp when I heard the growl. 
low guttural sound right behind me. I whirled around, rifle raised, and saw it, crouched in the bushes, taller than any dog I'd ever seen, for it was pitch black, coarse, like it had been dragged through mud. The head, that was worse. A wolf snout on a skull too long, mouth lined with rows of jagged teeth. But those eyes were the worst, burning yellow, filled with a hunger that wasn't just animal. That look told me this creature knew exactly what I was, its next meal. I don't know what made me fire instead of freeze. Maybe blind panic. Maybe some stupid, primal part of my brain figured it was fight or die. The shot echoed, ridiculously loud in the silent forest. The creature snarled, a horrible, chilling sound, and lurched towards me. I fired again more out of desperation than hope. Hit it in the shoulder, judging by the yelp. It didn't fall, just stumbled, then turned and bolted back into the trees. The stink it left behind was like an open grave. I didn't stick around to admire my marksmanship. Threw my stuff together as fast as my shaking hands allowed, and ran. Ran till I thought my heart would burst, till I stumbled out of the woods practically onto the highway, back to the truck Kellen had dropped me at. Half expected to see it waiting for me, that long snout and those gleaming eyes. It wasn't there. Maybe I'd heard it bad enough to give myself a chance. Maybe it was just playing with me. But I didn't stick around to find out. Kellen looked at me like I was some kind of swamp monster when I showed up a day early. I told him some story about a run-in with a poacher, couldn't admit the truth, figured he'd write me off as a lunatic. But he saw the look in my eyes, I think. Never went back to the Ozarks. Figured once was enough. Some nights, though, when I hear a police siren wail and its pitch shifts just a certain way, it takes me right back to that clearing, that creature, and the sound of its howl echoing through the trees. And I wonder if I really got away, or if it's still out there somewhere, biding its time. This happened to me a few years ago. I still shudder to think about it. You know, I'm a pretty down-to-earth guy. I like to keep things simple. Don't buy into any of the supernatural stuff you see on late-night TV. But even after all this time, I have no earthly idea how to explain what happened out in the woods. My name's Rick, by the way. Back then, me and a couple buddies, Dan and Elliot, we used to hit the trails up by Lake Salish every few months. It was a great place, dense forest, secluded, just a few hours' hike from the nearest road. We'd take enough food and gear for a long weekend, make a real escape of it. That particular trip back in, well, doesn't matter when, exactly, things got strange right from the start. See, we always hiked a different route into the heart of the forest, set up camp on the shores of the lake. But this time, we stumbled across this overgrown fire road, and something about it just called out to us. Dan... Always the joker says, Hey fellas, how about an adventure on the beaten path for once? Now, this road wasn't on any map we had. It wound through the trees deeper and deeper than we'd ever ventured. The sun barely made it through the canopy, and by the second day, the air was damp and thick. Not ominous, exactly, but enough to raise those little hairs on the back of your neck. Then things started to change. We found it right in the middle of the trail half a deer. No, not like a hunter shot it and took the good bits. I mean half a deer, torn from front to back as smooth as you could cut it with a butcher's knife. No blood around it, no smell of rot. Just the other half missing without a trace. We stood there, frozen, not a word between us. Dan, bless him, broke the spell. Let's get out of here. 
Logic went out the window after that one. We should have turned around, found our way back. Instead, something twisted in my mind. There was an answer to this, somewhere on this damn road. We hurried on. An hour later, same type of thing, a man's torso, clothes on, laying like a discarded mannequin. No head, no legs, just gone. And still clean, fresh as could be. Elliot threw up right there on the path. The sun was dipping at that point. We made a panic camp, a tight little circle barely big enough for the tent. We weren't about to sleep with those, things out there in the dark. The night passed in terrified silence. Dan whispered the question on all our minds. What the hell kind of animal does this? No mountain lion or bear tears prey apart so neatly. We didn't sleep a wink. When the gray dawn finally broke, it wasn't a relief at all. Just a chance to see what we were dealing with. Elliot had completely lost it, blubbering, begging to turn back. I knew the road was madness now, but we couldn't leave him like that. Dan, ever the steady one, pulled out his pistol. Just for emergencies— he said, although we all knew it probably wasn't going to do much good against what we'd seen so far. Two hours later, we heard it a rustle in the trees, branches snapping. We huddled close, guns shaking a bit in Dan's hand. Then, it stepped out onto the road. I still can't fully describe the thing. It was tall, too tall on two legs but hunched like an ape. For black as night covered most of it, except for the head, that was all wrong. Like a dog's muzzle stretched out, teeth glistening too long and sharp, eyes like twin burning coals. It froze for a long moment, just staring at us. Then a low hiss came from its throat, not an animal sound at all. We bolted. We didn't look back, didn't stop. It was faster, the crack of branches getting closer until a terrifying howl echoed right behind Elliot. He screamed just once, and then the forest went silent again. We stumbled out of the trees, bloody, bruised, barely sane. We flagged down a ranger, said there'd been an accident, an attack by a wild animal, anything but the truth. Elliot's never been found. Sometimes, late at night, I imagine that thing out there in the darkness, still walking the old fire road, searching. It's why I never go into the woods anymore. This happened to me a few years back, on a business trip to Oregon. I'm Miles, sales rep. Boring job, lots of flights, lots of time to kill in unfamiliar towns. But this one, it stuck with me. I should have known something was off from the moment I landed. Little airport, nestled way out amongst those towering pine forests the Pacific Northwest is famous for. The locals, they had a certain look to them. Kept to themselves, not unfriendly but like they had secrets they weren't about to share. Place I stayed that night was an old motel on the edge of town. Room smelled like must and old cigarettes, but hey, it was cheap, and I wasn't planning on staying put. Next morning, I had some time before my meetings, so I decided to explore a bit. There was a hiking trail that started right behind the motel, heading off into the woods. Figured I could get some fresh air before another day spent trapped in conference rooms. Trail was more overgrown than the map made it seem. The trees closed in, sunlight barely filtering through the thick canopy. I started getting that prickly feeling at the back of my neck, like I was being watched. Should have listened to that instinct, turn back while I could. That's when I found the clearing. Not a natural one. Trees were felled in a wide circle, the stumps hacked at roughly like someone was in a hurry. And in the center, well, it was an altar of some kind. Stacked stones, rough-hewn, 
and stained with something dark and old. Then I saw the bones. Animal bones, mostly, deer may be bigger. But mixed in were others I couldn't place. Skulls too long for coyotes, fragments of what looked like hands, but not human hands. A wave of nausea hit me then, and I stumbled back. That's when I heard the growl. It came from the far side of the clearing, low and guttural. My blood ran cold. I spun around and saw it. Standing just inside the tree line was the biggest damn wolf I'd ever seen. Easily the size of a bear cub, and its fur was the color of midnight. But those weren't wolf's eyes looking at me. They were too intelligent, with a cold, calculating gleam. And that muzzle, elongated, the teeth jutting out in a snarl. This wasn't a sick animal, wasn't some escaped zoo specimen. No, this was something different, something unnatural. I broke and ran. Didn't think, just a blind terror propelling me forward. I could hear it bounding after me, its breath rasping, but fear lent me a burst of speed. Branches whipped my face, I stumbled, regained my footing, kept going. Then, a different sound cut through the panic thudding of my own heart, a gunshot. It echoed off the trees, and I heard a yelp, more surprised than hurt. Then another shot, and a howl that cut off abruptly. The creature, whatever it was, had fled. Moments later, I broke through the trees and onto a dirt road. There, parked in a beat-up truck, was an old man with a rifle resting across the open window. He looked at me, his face creased with more than just age, and nodded. Thought I might have company out here, he grunted. Never seen you around before, though. I stammered out my thanks, asked him what the hell that had been back in the woods. His face grew grimmer. Dogman, he said voice low. Some folks call him that. They've been around these parts since before I was born. Hunt the woods and such. Don't always bother people, but, well, you saw one hungry enough to get reckless. He lowered the rifle, gave me a long, scrutinizing look. Best head on back to town, son. Don't come back out this way, not unless you know how to handle yourself. I nodded, not trusting my voice. Got in my rental car, and drove straight to the airport. Missed my meetings, got on the first flight out of there, and never looked back. Some folks might say it was just a wild dog or something got loose. Maybe they're right. But I'll never forget the size of that thing, the cunning gleam in its eyes. And every now and then, lying awake at night, I hear the rustle of leaves on my window, and swear I smell the musty damp of that forest clearing. This happened to me a few years ago, down in the Louisiana Bayou. Not the kind of place most folks visit, especially not alone. Me, though, I like the quiet. Did some freelance IT work, could do it from anywhere. Figured I'd spend a few weeks in a little cabin out there, get away from the city, reconnect with nature, that kind of thing. My name's Harris, by the way. First few days went fine. I fished in the swamp, did some hiking on the old trails, saw some gators, bunch of weird birds, nothing too out of the ordinary. Then, one evening, I was sitting on the porch when I heard it, howling coming from deeper in the woods. Not a coyote, not anything I recognized. Sounded bigger, deeper, with an edge to it that made my neck hairs stand up. Figured it must be some kind of big dog from a nearby farm, got loose. Didn't think much of it. Next morning, I went for a walk, found a deer carcass picked clean not too far from the cabin. Okay, that was unsettling, but big predators are a fact of life out there. 
told myself it was probably a bear, though something about how the bones were cracked seemed wrong. That night, I didn't sleep much. The howls were back, closer this time. And there was another sound too, kind of a shuffling, like something big moving around the cabin. I flipped on the porch light, peered out, but didn't see anything. Told myself I was getting spooked by nothing, but I propped a chair against the door for good measure. The next few days I stayed close to the cabin. Figured whatever was out there would move on eventually. But the noises persisted, getting bolder. I started catching glimpses of movement at the edge of the woods. Hard to make out, but big, hunched, not moving like any animal I knew. Fear was starting to gnaw at me, the kind that sits in your gut. Then came the night that changed everything. I was sitting inside, trying to read, when I heard a bang against the window. Jumped out of my skin. At the window I saw it, pressed right up against the glass. A huge, hairy face, wolf-like but twisted somehow, the snout too long, the eyes glowing yellow. I backed away, heart thundering. It pounded at the glass a few more times, then backed off, disappearing into the darkness. I spent the rest of the night huddled in a corner, old shotgun from the cabin closet in my lap. Knew I wouldn't get any more sleep. First light, I packed my things. I had to get out of there. I didn't know what the thing was, but I wasn't sticking around to find out. Ran to my truck, started it up, and peeled out down the dirt track leading back towards the highway. Glanced in the rearview mirror, and that's when I saw it come out of the trees. It was running at an impossible speed, huge paws hitting the ground in long strides, closing in on the truck. I floored the gas pedal, swerving as it leaped, claws scraping the side of the truck. I thought I'd lost it, but then heard the thud as it landed on the roof. Metal shrieked as it dug in. I swerved wildly, trying to throw it off, but it held on. Heard a window shatter, then a snarl right above me. A hairy arm snaked inside, flailing. I grabbed the shotgun, fired a wild shot upwards. It roared, and the weight on the roof was gone. I didn't stop driving until I hit a small town, hours away. Went straight to the sheriff's office, babbling about the creature in the swamp. Sheriff looked at me like I'd lost my mind. Didn't press charges or anything, but the amused glances from his deputies, that was almost worse. Got out of the bayou, never went back. Took me a long time to sleep soundly again. Folks think I'm crazy, maybe I am a little. But they don't know what's lurking out there in the shadows. Some things defy explanation. I started looking into old Cajun folklore later, stories of the Ruguru, a kind of werewolf creature. Fits what I saw better than anything else. Whether it was a monster, a wild animal messed up somehow, or some backwoods lunatic in a costume, I don't know. All I know is that if I'd stayed in that cabin any longer... I wouldn't be here to tell the tale. This happened to me a few years back, when I was working as a ranger in Yellowstone National Park. Gorgeous country, but wild. You gotta respect that wilderness, even if it's your job to be out in it. My name is Elias, by the way. I was assigned alone to a remote backcountry cabin, doing trail maintenance and wildlife monitoring. The solitude didn't bother me most days. But on bad nights, when the wind howled and the trees creaked, it could get a little spooky. One evening, I was coming back from setting up camera traps. Got caught out after dark which I tried to avoid because of bears and such. I was maybe half a mile from the cabin when I heard it, a growl coming from deeper in the trees. Figured it was a black bear, 
may be rummaging for something I'd left in my pack. I stopped and listened. But the growl came again, and it wasn't quite right for a bear. This was deeper, more guttural, and it had an edge to it that made the hair stand up on my neck. Then came a crashing sound through the brush, like something big moving towards me. I turned my flashlight on, swung it towards the sound. The beam of light caught a pair of eyes reflecting back, glowing in eerie yellow. My heart hammered in my chest as the creature stepped out of the darkness. It wasn't a bear. I'd seen enough of those to know. This thing was enormous, standing at least seven feet tall on its hind legs. Its body was covered in shaggy dark fur, its muzzle long and wolf-like. But its posture, its forelimbs, that was wrong, all wrong. A chill went through me as realization hit. This was one of those creatures from the stories, the kind of tales rangers tell around campfires to spook newbies. A dogman. It snarled at me, flashing wicked fangs. I backed away slowly, trying not to make any sudden moves. I fumbled for the bear spray on my belt, but I knew it wouldn't do much good against this thing. It took a step closer. Then, with a lunge, it was charging at me. I turned and ran. I heard it snarling behind me, its footfalls heavy on the ground. I swerved through the trees, branches whipping my face. I could feel its hot breath on the back of my neck. Up ahead, I saw the cabin lights, a beacon of hope. I sprinted the last stretch, bursting through the door and slamming it shut. I threw the bolt, my hand shaking. Leaned against the door, listening. I heard it slam into the cabin wall, the whole structure rattling. It circled, snarling and clawing at the windows. For a horrible moment, I thought the flimsy wooden door was all that stood between me and those terrible claws. I frantically searched the cabin for anything I could use as a weapon. Found an old axe next to the fireplace. Clutched it in my hands, heart pounding, as I waited for the inevitable attack. But after what felt like an eternity, the noises outside subsided. When dawn finally broke, I cautiously peered out. There was no sign of the creature, only some deep gouges in the cabin walls. Shaken to my core, I radioed for backup. They arrived a few hours later, armed men who looked skeptical when I tried to explain what had happened. They found tracks, enormous wolf-like prints, that stopped abruptly at the edge of the woods. No one believed my story about the creature, of course. I didn't stick around in that cabin much longer. Requested a transfer back to a busier area of the park. See a lot of tourists now, and the noise and bustle is a comfort in a weird way. Sometimes, I'll see a big dog bounding around and a flicker of panic will go through me, even though I know it's just a normal dog. Folks hear my story and they think I made it up, or had one too many whiskeys out there in the wilderness. But I know what I saw. The image of that creature, the way its yellow eyes burned through the darkness, it seared into my memory. I tried to tell myself it was some freak of nature, an undiscovered animal, even though deep down, a part of me knows better. The park rangers have a saying. There's strange things out there in the woods. Turns out, they're more right than they know. This happened to me a few years back, on a trip to the Smoky Mountains. I'm Eamon, retired now, but I used to work as a surveyor, way out in the back country. It was good, honest work, even if a bit lonely sometimes. Figured spending time in nature was better than rotting in a cubicle. But after what I saw, well, I put in my two weeks' notice the moment I got back to civilization. We were up on a ridge mapping a new section of trail. 
thick trees, the kind of place where a man could disappear and never be found. My partner, Ben, was a seasoned outdoorsman, knew those woods like his own backyard. Me, I was still finding my footing, sometimes literally. It was near sundown when I stumbled into the clearing. Not much of one, just a patch of dirt ringed by old, half-dead trees. Something was off about that place. No birdsong, no rustle of squirrels, just a heavy, oppressive silence. And there in the center of the clearing, it was a carcass, stripped down to the bone. Dear, at first I thought, but something was wrong with the skull. Too long, too many teeth. Then I heard Ben yell from further down the ridge. Amen! Get your tail over here! Something's wrong! I ran, my breath catching in my throat. Found him up a gnarled oak tree, his face white as ash. He pointed down into the ravine below. At first, I couldn't make it out with the evening light fading, but then the creature moved. It stood on two legs like a man, easily seven feet tall. Its body was lean, sinewy, covered in matted black fur. The head, that was what stuck with me, a wolf's muzzle stretched long, its mouth lined with needle-sharp teeth. And those eyes glowed yellow in the half-light, filled with a chilling intelligence. Not an animal, not fully. Something else. Dogman, Ben whispered, his voice hoarse. Thought they was just stories. It lifted its head then, scenting the air, and I knew it had caught our smell. We were dead men if we stayed there. Ben didn't even try to climb down the way we came, just dropped out of the tree and ran for it. I followed, my legs pumping on pure instinct. Branches whipped my face, but I didn't feel the pain, just the hot breath of that thing on the back of my neck. We burst out of the trees onto the gravel road where our truck was parked. Didn't stop running until we saw the headlights. Ben slammed on the brakes, swerved off the road, throwing up gravel. I piled into the passenger seat, and he floored it. I looked back, half expecting to see that creature loping after us, but there was nothing but the shadows of the trees. Ben drove straight to the nearest town, some tiny place with a single bar and a flickering gas station. Burst in there, white-faced and babbling about monsters in the woods. The locals looked at us like we'd sprouted horns, mix of amusement and pity. Seemed they heard it all before, drunk ramblings and tall tales. Except for the old guy in the corner booth. He didn't laugh. Just nodded, slow and deliberate. Said there's things in the mountains, things older than the first settlers. Best to leave them be, to not go looking where you ain't meant to. The next morning, we drove out of there fast as we could. Ben dropped me off back in the city without a word, like he was afraid whatever I'd seen was contagious. After that, I couldn't go back to the woods, not when every snap of a twig made me jump and every rustle of leaves sounded like claws on bark. Ben, he kept working outdoors. Said confronting your demons was the only way to chase them off. Last I heard, he'd headed up to Alaska, looking for a surveying gig out on the tundra. Stubborn fool. I heard a few months later about a hiker that went missing in those parts. Body was never found. Just tracks that didn't add up. Sometimes, late at night, I dream I'm back in that clearing. The silence hangs in the air, the carcass lies picked clean, and then the creature steps out of the shadows. Its eyes gleam in the darkness, and I know it's found me again. This happened to me a couple years back, before I moved to the city. I was living in a small town tucked into the foothills of the Smoky Mountains. Beautiful country, but kinda lonely. Me, 
I'm more into computers and video games than hanging out. My name's Ryland, by the way. But I did have one friend around there, Elijah. He was the outgoing type, always dragging me along on some adventure. One Saturday, he showed up at my door all excited. He'd read about this old, abandoned asylum out in the woods. Said it had a dark history, the usual stories about patients mistreated, maybe even some murders that they covered up. Perfect spooky weekend trip, according to him. Me, I thought it sounded dumb, maybe even dangerous. But he finally talked me into it. We took my old jeep out there, along some barely marked trails. The place had been empty for decades. Peeling paint, crumbling structure, that whole haunted vibe. Elijah was thrilled. I mostly wished I'd stayed home. We poked around the outside, found a busted window on the lower floor, and climbed inside. Even with daylight filtering in, the place was creepy. Long, echoing hallways, empty rooms that smelled old. You could almost imagine screams coming from those bare walls. We came across what must have been the common area. Huge vaulted ceiling, bits of broken furniture scattered around. Elijah insisted on exploring further, but I wanted out. That's when we heard the noise. A scratching sound coming from further in the building. I froze. Elijah, though, he got this gleam in his eye, like it only made things more interesting. He started edging towards the sound. I didn't want to be left alone, so I followed, heart pounding. It led us to a wing that looked even more rotten, holes in the floor, water damage everywhere. We reached a room at the end. No more scratching, but the silence felt worse. There was a smell. Musty and thick, almost metallic. Elijah took one step into the room, gasped. I saw it then. A huge shape hunched in the shadows. Way too big to be any animal I knew. It turned, and I saw a flash of yellow eyes before it let out a roar that shook the whole building. Elijah screamed. We both took off, back down the corridor. I heard the crashing of heavy paws behind us. Elijah tripped, stumbled right in front of me. The thing was on him in a second, a blur of claws and teeth. I just stood there, frozen, as it ripped into him. Screaming, gurgling, then it went quiet. Only the sound of the thing breathing and messy tearing sounds. I came back to my senses then. I turned and ran back towards the window where we got in, vaulted over it, landing hard on the other side. Didn't look back. Just ran for the jeep, fumbling with my keys. I drove like a maniac, back roads, main roads, didn't care. Ended up at the nearest police station, hysterical. Told them everything about the asylum, the creature, Elijah. They looked at me like I was cracked up. Searched the asylum, found nothing. No trace of my friend, no sign of what I described. Put it down to me either making it up, or some kind of drug-induced hallucination. But I know what happened out there. The cops, they don't believe in things they wouldn't understand. I started doing my own research then online. Obscure legends, stories about creatures out in the deep woods, half-man, half-wolf. Dogmen, some call them. Elijah's gone because of me. If I just stayed at home that day like I wanted. Sometimes, late at night, I imagine that thing is still out there, sniffing around the edge of town. I keep blinds drawn, triple-check the locks on the doors. I always assumed there was nothing in the darkness to really be afraid of. Now, I'm not so sure. This happened to me a few years ago, down in the Texas Hill Country. 
I'm a photographer, do a lot of nature work, so I'm used to being out in the woods alone. That area is all rugged, rolling hills covered in scrub oak, a few isolated ranches scattered around. My name's Wyatt, by the way. I was working on a project, trying to capture some of the local wildlife at night. Took a lot of patience. Set up my camera traps, then found this old, abandoned shack out in the middle of nowhere to hunker down for a few days. Figured it was better than sleeping in my truck. First couple of nights went fine. Got some cool shots, a bobcat, a huge owl, the usual. Then, the third night, I woke up to scratching sounds. Assumed it was a raccoon sniffing around for scraps outside the shack. But then came a snarl, and the scratching got louder, right at the flimsy door. I grabbed my flashlight, shone it through the window. There it was. For a split second, I thought it was a huge dog rearing up at the door. But then I got a good look at it. It stood on its hind legs, easily as tall as a man, hunched over. Its fur was thick and dark, its head a snarling mess of fangs and gleaming yellow eyes. This wasn't any dog I'd ever seen. Something about it was wrong. I stumbled back, heart pounding. The thing slammed against the door, making the whole shack shake. I fumbled for my phone. No signal, of course. It kept throwing itself at the door, snarling and clawing. I was frozen with terror. Then, like that, it stopped. Silence. I stayed huddled on the floor, too terrified to move. Didn't sleep another wink that night. I waited for the sun to come up, every creak of the old wood sending jolts through me. At dawn, I cautiously approached the door. There were huge gouge marks clawed into the wood, and a sickening, musky smell hung in the air. I didn't waste any time packing my gear. Drove straight out of there and didn't stop until I hit the main highway. When I got back into cell range, the first thing I did was try to do some research. Turns out, there were legends in the area. Old stories whispered about a creature that walked like a man but had the head of a wolf. Locals called it a skinwalker, or something like that. I was skeptical at first, figured it was just folklore. But after what I saw, I wasn't so sure anymore. Didn't go back to the hill country for a long time. Still have trouble sleeping when I'm out in the wilderness. My buddies gave me a lot of crap when I tried to tell them what happened. One of them joked that maybe I should get into Bigfoot photography instead. It was no joke to me. I spent hours scouring the internet, reading every first-hand account of dogman sightings I could find. There were more than I expected, scattered all over the country. Most folks dismissed it as nonsense, the rest seemed legitimately spooked. Started to think I wasn't alone, wasn't crazy. Then, there was the news report. A rancher, a couple of counties over, filmed something weird on his security cameras. Grainy footage, but it sent chills down my spine. A tall, loping shape moving through the pasture looked just like that thing at the shack. The local sheriff said it was likely a coyote with mange. The rancher wasn't buying it. Neither was I. A few weeks back, I finally made myself head back out to that area. One armed this time had a shotgun and a pistol. Found the abandoned shack again. No sign of that creature, but the damage to the door was still there. It felt, defiant, somehow, me being back there. I'm not going out there at night again. Don't know what that thing was, if it was some twisted animal a legend come to life, or something else entirely. But I know one thing for sure, the next time I hear a scratch at the door in the middle of nowhere, I'm not opening it to find out what's on the other side.
This happened to me a few years ago, back when I lived in upstate New York. I'm a pretty normal guy, name's Trevor. Back then, I worked in tech, nothing too exciting. I was into hiking, taking day trips to explore the trails and forests outside the city. It was a great way to unwind after a long week at the office. One weekend, I decided to check out the trails around the old abandoned town of Harrow Creek. I'd heard some stories, old legends about people disappearing around that area. Didn't think much of it, figured they were just campfire tales. I packed my stuff, hopped in the car, and set off early in the morning. Harrow Creek was creepy. Even driving into the place gave me the chills. Buildings were crumbling, windows boarded up, and not a soul in sight. I found a trailhead on the edge of town and parked. The trail started off well-maintained but quickly became overgrown. I had to push through branches, the forest pressing in from all sides. I joked to myself about needing a machete. It felt like hours, but eventually I stumbled across a clearing. There was an old cabin in the center, partially collapsed. I walked towards it, thinking it might be a good place for a break. That's when I saw it, a massive pile of bones outside the cabin. Deer may be bare, but some of them looked wrong. Too big, the wrong shape. I backed up slowly. Something wasn't right. Then I heard a snap from the woods. I froze heart pounding in my chest. A dark shape moved between the trees. It was huge, and the way it moved, not like any animal I'd ever seen. Taller than a man, hunched over, but running on four legs. For a split second, I saw it clearly, long, matted fur, massive claws, and a muzzle full of teeth. My brain screamed dog, but bigger, far stronger, and those eyes, they were intelligent. I didn't wait for a second look. I bolted back the way I came, crashing through the undergrowth. I could hear it behind me, heavy paws pounding the ground, and guttural snarls that chilled me to the bone. I scrambled up a rocky outcrop for a better view, praying I'd lost it. Below me, the trees parted. The creature stepped into the sunlight. It was enormous, easily eight feet tall when it reared up on its hind legs. Thick fur covered its body, almost black, with patches of gray. Its head was like a wolf's, but bigger, and its eyes, those eyes were human, filled with chilling malice. It sniffed the air and turned its head, as if trying to pick up my scent. I didn't have time to think. I slipped down the rocks cutting myself up, and ran for my life. The forest blurred as I stumbled through it, the thing's snarls getting closer. Every time I looked back, it was gaining on me, its massive form weaving through the trees like they were nothing. I broke out of the woods, hitting the dusty road leading to Harrow Creek. I sprinted towards my car, not daring to look back. I fumbled with the keys, finally getting the door open and throwing myself inside. I slammed it shut, locked it, and threw the car into gear. It roared to life, and I stomped on the gas. As I pulled away, I glanced in the rearview mirror. The creature broke out of the forest, standing near the tree lean. It tilted its head, watching me. Even from that distance— I swore I could see a cruel glint in its eyes. I hit the gas harder and didn't look back until I was miles away. When I got home, I reported it to the park rangers. They looked at me like I was crazy. I didn't blame them. A few weeks later, I moved back to the city. I haven't been hiking since. Sometimes I swear I see shapes moving in the shadows, hear growls on the wind. I lock my doors twice and never walk alone at night. I know it's out there, somewhere in the woods, still waiting.
This happened to me a couple of years ago on vacation. Took the wife and kids up to the Ozarks. Figured it'd be good for them, all that fresh air and fishing instead of staring at screens like they do back home. I'm Eli, by the way, work at the plant. Not the adventurous type usually, but everyone talks up those mountains. We rented a cabin off the beaten track, way up on some ridge with a hell of a view come morning. The place was old, creaked like it had stories of its own. Kids loved it at first, said it felt like a fairy tale. Wife gave me that look the one that says I'm dragging them off into the boon is to be murdered. Teenagers, always so dramatic. First day went smooth. Hiked some trails, swam in the lake. Even got a campfire going, toasted marshmallows and everything. But come nightfall, that's when it got weird. First, it was the sounds. Not birds, not crickets, nothing like you'd expect, but a kind of rustling, circling the cabin. And this low moaning, set your teeth on edge. Kids got spooked, and honestly, I wasn't far behind. Next morning, I went out to get firewood from the shed. Found the door busted open, wood scattered. Figured raccoons or something, didn't think much of it. But then I saw the marks all over the shed walls, claw marks, big ones, too deep to be any normal animal. Started feeling uneasy then. Told the family we'd check out some caves on the tourist trail that day. Figured safer in a crowd. Caves were okay, all lit up, but that nagging feeling would leave me. On the drive back, my daughter, Maya, said she'd seen something moving in the trees along the road. Wife told her to stop with the scary stories. I didn't say anything, but I'd seen it too, just a flash of dark fur, too big to be a deer. That night was the worst. We were playing board games after dinner when the power went out. Cabin went pitch black, and we heard this scratching at the windows, like something big was trying to get in. Kids screamed, I grabbed the flashlight, trying to keep it together. That's when I saw it out the window. In the beam of the flashlight, it stood tall as a man, hunched over, but wrong. Covered in thick black fur, long arms, and a muzzle dripping with teeth. I swear its eyes glowed red right back at me. Then it was gone. Wife tried to say it was probably a bear gone rabid, but I knew better. There was something smarter in those eyes. Like it was sizing us up. I barricaded the doors, kept watch all night, rifle in hand. I'm not a church-going man, but I prayed until dawn broke. As soon as the store in town opened— we packed up and left. Never said a word about what we'd seen, didn't want to scare the kids more, figured nobody would believe us anyway. Drove straight home and didn't look back. A week later, I was flipping channels at home when I saw a news report, missing family in the Ozarks, near where we stayed. Campers, car abandoned, and they showed a picture of the mauled tent. Looked like what that? That thing did to the woodshed. Sent a shiver down my spine. My wife says I shouldn't look into it, shouldn't stir anything up. But I can't shake the thought of those red eyes in the dark, and the sound of those claws on the window. Part of me feels guilty, like we got away and others didn't. Another part, well, it's afraid. I started doing some online searches— late at night when no one else is awake. Old legends of the Ozarks, sightings of things that don't make sense. Stuff about dogmen, creatures that walk upright but aren't human, said to be hunters. I don't know what to believe anymore, but what I saw that night, it was real. And I think, I think it's still out there. This happened to me a few years ago, down in Louisiana. Name's Remy, 
and I work the rigs, oil, mostly. It's lonely work, out in those bayous where the water's black and the alligators watch you with hungry eyes. But it pays well, lets me provide for my kids. Problem is, those long shifts mean sometimes you see things you're not meant to. This particular job, it was a small rig, way out on its own. We were due for a crew change soon, but meanwhile it was just me, my buddy Theo, and a new guy, green as grass. Theo and me, we knew the bayous, knew the old stories about things that crawled through the swamps at night. New guy mocked us, called us superstitious. Me, I figured he'd either learn or get himself killed. It happened a night or two before the changeover. Power went out generator problem. Wasn't a storm, just sudden failure. Theo swore, I went to fix it, and the newbie, fool kid he was, tagged along. It was dark. Headlamps made the mist swirl, gave everything an eerie glow. Got the generator going, but the newbie got antsy, said he heard something moving in the trees just beyond the lights. Theo laughed, said it was gators but I wasn't so sure. There was a rustling, too heavy for a gator, and it was coming closer. That's when we saw it. For a heart-stopping second, it stepped into the light on the edge of the swamp. Tall as a man, hunched over, but with too many limbs, too long the muzzle. Its fur was thick, dark, almost oily, and its eyes, like nothing I'd ever seen, too bright, too smart. A dogman, straight out of the old legends. We froze. Then the new guy, idiot that he was, screamed. The creature lunged forward, a blur of darkness. I heard Theo yell, heard a wet, horrible sound, and then nothing but the buzzing of insects in the darkness. I grabbed the newbie, ran like hell back to the rig. Didn't stop running till we hit the safety lights the barbed wire fence. Locked ourselves in, called for help on the satellite phone. Told them Theo was in trouble, animal attack, but I knew in my gut it wasn't any kind of animal I'd ever seen on a wildlife show. A rescue crew came out the next day. They found what was left of Theo. Said it must have been a bear gone rogue, maybe rabid. Didn't explain the footprints that weren't bear-shaped or the way the bones had been gnawed almost clean. The newbie, he quit the rig work after that, and honestly, I don't blame him. Some nights, lying awake on my bunk, I swear I hear that rustling in the dark outside my trailer, and a low growl that sets my teeth on edge. Reminds me I'm a long way from the bayou, but maybe not far enough. The next morning, news came through on the radio a local trapper, gone missing from his cabin further upriver. They never found him, not a trace. I called the company, told them I wouldn't work that site again, not for all the money in the world. They called me superstitious, same as the newbie did. But I saw what I saw. Here's the thing about the bayous, they're old. They hold secrets older than written words. Some secrets are land and water, roots and scales. Others, other secrets walk on two legs, or four, or some unholy number in between. They have teeth, and claws, and a hunger that doesn't abide by the laws of nature. I saw one of those secrets, out in the flickering shadows of the rig lights. And I learned something that night. Some stories are told for a reason— some legends are born out of the red stain of blood on the dark water. You can laugh at them if you want. Or you can keep your eyes peeled and your back to a wall, and pray that when the shadows move, it's just the wind in the reeds. This happened to me a few years back on a trip I'll never forget. I'm not a superstitious type, never put much stock in old wives' tales. 
But when you see something with your own eyes, something that can't be explained, well, it changes a man. My name's Carter. I own a small auto shop, nothing fancy, oil changes and brake pads kind of stuff. Keeps me busy, but I like to get out and breathe fresh air now and then. My old pal Josh and I, we decided on a fishing weekend out in Humboldt County, California. Those giant redwoods up there are something else, you know? The air smells like pine needles and damp earth, thick enough to chew. We rented a clapped-out cabin a few miles from the highway, the kind of place that hasn't seen a fresh coat of paint in a decade. Didn't matter, we were there to fish, not to check out the decor. First day went smooth. Caught a few trout, drank a few more beers by the campfire. It was that second morning things got weird. Josh has always been the early bird, leaves me snoring while he casts his line as the sun comes up. He wasn't at camp when I woke up, but I figured he'd just push further downstream. Ate some leftovers and decided to hike a new trail near the cabin. The trail wound through the dense forest, barely wide enough for one person. After about a half hour, I came out on a ridge. View was incredible. I could see the whole valley stretched out below. But that's not what caught my eye. Below me was a campsite. A tent ripped to shreds, gear scattered around it like a whirlwind had blown through, and blood. So much blood. Then I saw it, a flash of movement from the tree line. It wasn't Josh. Hell, it didn't even look human. This thing was enormous, hunched over on two legs, its back covered in dark fur. For one horrifying second, it stared straight at me, its muzzle twisted into a snarling grimace. Then it turned and disappeared into the shadows. I stumbled back to the cabin, heart pounding like a drum. Josh's truck was still there, but no sign of him. The logical part of my brain kicked in for a second. Maybe a mountain lion got to him. But those things aren't that big, and they sure as hell don't walk upright. I called his name until my throat was raw, then started scouring the woods. Nothing. As the sun began to set, I got that sinking feeling in my gut. Josh was gone, and whatever had been out there, it was still around. It took every ounce of willpower I had to get myself back to the truck. That night, I locked all the doors, slept with a hunting knife under my pillow, and listened to the rustle of every leaf outside. I didn't close my eyes for a second. Come daylight, there was only one thing to do. I drove to the nearest ranger's station, my voice shaking the whole way. Told them my story watched their faces shift from polite disbelief to something a lot closer to fear. They sent out a search party, but there was no trace of Josh, nothing at all. The cops questioned me for hours, made noises about bear attacks, and such, but I could tell they didn't fully believe me. It's been years, and I haven't been back to Humboldt. Sometimes I think about going to find whatever that thing was. Hunt it down, put a bullet through its head. There's a kind of twisted justice in it. But another, wiser part of me knows some things are better left alone. Josh wouldn't want me to risk it. These nights, though, I still picture that campsite, the blood gleaming wet in the morning light. I hear Josh calling my name, his voice fading as I run towards the sound. And somewhere, I know it's still out there. Huge, monstrous, inhuman, waiting in the deep green shadows.